you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Thank you, Mrs. Dunphy. I'll be back shortly. You're going out? I'm afraid so. But you've only just returned. Unfortunately, that is the nature of my work. Another business trip? The most important of all. But first, there are arrangements to be made. I've prepared your afternoon meal. I'm sure it will keep. Can you not make these arrangements by telephone? No, no. Some things can't be left to chance. In the meanwhile, follow my instructions precisely. To the letter, Mrs. Dunphy. Do I make myself clear? I believe so. You believe so? Then let me make it absolutely clear. <sighs> Sit down for a moment. But if you're on your way... It's necessary that you understand. And the only way to be sure is to tell you how it began, please. If you wish, sir. I must warn you, it's an incredible story. I, of all people, know that. So incredible that you won't believe me at first. But I'm going to tell you everything. Then you will believe. Because you must. You must believe. Do you know Central Europe? Europe? Only as a child, sir. It started there many years ago, after the First World War. I was on a walking tour of France, Belgium, and Germany. I, I decided to travel alone with only a small pack. <laughs> the confidence of youth. Germany was magical then, a place of valleys and mountains and swift, dark rivers. There was nowhere else like it, a fertile land where... Everything grew tall and straight out of the earth. I was struck by the richness of the soil, the verdancy of the hills. Stepping across the border from Belgium, where the mustachioed guards saluted like tin soldiers, I entered a different world. Everywhere I looked, a swelling green ocean. On the farthest hills, tall, ancient buildings of stone. Estates, monasteries, castles, or what have you. Some of them in ruins. I stood a moment at the border and watched the hawks circling above, wondering how such a miracle could be. It was as if I had passed through an invisible door from a musty room into a magical kingdom of winds and light. But so much can change in the afternoon. By nightfall, clouds filled the sky and the storm moved in to darken the landscape. The nearest village was miles away. I was unprepared, dressed for a, a stroll up the Champs-Élysées, perhaps. In minutes, I was drenched and chilled to the bone. Then I saw it, a medieval castle, bombed almost to ruins, sitting like a broken fingernail atop Schwarzhof Mountain. I came to a wall of gray stone. It was an iron gate. Please! Please! <laughs> Summon! <laughs> Please let me in! A story told years ago by a man who recalled it from his youth. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, he was never able to put it out of his mind. It begins with a wayfaring traveler. His name is David Ellington, a scholar, seeker of truth, and to his dismay, a finder of truth. A man approaching exhaustion, who will confront a problem that has haunted the world since the beginning of time. A man who knocks on a gate, seeking sanctuary, and instead finds that he has just crossed an unmarked border into the far edges of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Howling Man, starring Fred Willard with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I found a rope by the gate and pulled it. Please! Someone! 
Yes? What is it? Let me in. I'm sorry. You, you don't understand. I'm traveling on foot. We don't allow visitors. I'm not a visitor. Uh, what is this place? It's called the Hermitage. And I'm a stranger caught in the storm. Your, your robe, the, the cross around your neck. You're a man of God. I'm lost. Don't you understand? Lost. Very well. Follow me. Thank you, brother. <coughs> You're ill. I'll be... I'll be all right. Once I dry out. <coughs> this way. What are these rooms? A barred window in each door. They look like... Well, cells. All are empty now. I see, but, but what were they? Wait here. What for? I'll speak to Brother Jerome. Who? What in the... Brother Jerome will see you now. Oh, what was that? The wind. Are you... sure? Come. The room had almost no furnishings. A straw pallet, a rude desk and chair, some books and religious oddments, very stark. The abbot himself was a fierce El Greco painting of a man, stooped and withered, but strong in every part of him. Like the monk who came to the gate, he wore a shepherd's cloak and carried a crooked staff. Why have you come here? My name is David Ellington. I got lost in the storm. <laughs> then I saw a lantern in the window. And what is it you want of us? Want? Only a little shelter, some food. We cannot help you here. You will have to leave. You call that a Christian attitude? Now, Mr. Ellington. Oh, for the love of... All right, if that's the way you want it. Sorry to have troubled you. <laughs> Give me a minute. <clears throat> I'll be out of here in... In... <sighs> Brother Christophorus. Yes? Carry him out of here. At once. Right away. I don't know how long I remained unconscious. When I, I came to, I was in a primitive cubicle, one of the cells. Walls and ceiling of gray stone, a single small window in the shape of an arch, the floor hard-packed dirt. The monk sat nearby in a chair. I lay under a blanket. Beneath me was a bed of straw. Water! He lives. God's infinite mercy. How long have I been here? Nine days, my son. Nine? Days? You were very ill. The fever was on you. Brother Jerome said you would die, and he sent me to watch over you. I have never seen a man die. He holds that it is an important teaching, but now I suppose it was not your time. Sorry to disappoint you. No, my boy, don't try to rise. You must rest. What in the name of heaven is that? In the name of heaven? Nothing. I, I mean the scream. Scream? That. What? Are you deaf? That cry, I heard it before. You said it was the wind. Ah, the wind cleanses the land after a storm. But it isn't the wind, is it? I don't understand your meaning. It's a man. Careful. You must regain your strength. There! Don't tell me you didn't hear it! Perhaps you would like some soup. It's cold, but nourishing. What I would like, brother, is to leave this place. I'm afraid that's impossible. What do you mean? Only that you're not well enough to travel. And of course, you won't be well enough to travel as long as you think you hear such sounds. Now, the soup. I, I don't want it. Open, please. There. That's better. Over the next few hours, my strength did return, or at least some of it. I waited until the monk had fallen asleep. Then at last I made my move. The door was held shut by a simple iron bolt. I had only to slide it a few inches without waking him. 
almost free. But I could not remember which way we had come. When I turned into another corridor, I realized I was lost. It was a maze of dark passages and doors. Here, a part of the ruined ceiling was broken away, and I saw that the moon had risen. In the naked light of the moon, I saw one door different somehow from the others. At first, I was not sure why. Then I realized that in place of a bolt, it was held shut by a piece of wood, a mere stick, crooked and curved, like the peculiar staffs carried by the monk and the abbot, only in miniature, no, no greater in length than, well, than my forearm. On this door, in this door alone, a small wooden staff replaced the iron bolt. How odd! I looked through the opening in the door. Inside, a filthy, shadowed hovel. No table or chair, no straw for a bed. It appeared to be empty. What? It was a man. Huddled in the corner, holding his knees and rocking head and back like an animal. In the soiled moonlight, I saw his dirty beard, his, his rotted clothes. Who are you? Help me. Stay back. No, please. In the name of humanity, help me. But who? You're not one of them. No, my name is Ellington. I'm an American. Shh, shh. What are you afraid of? Them? Listen, do you hear them coming? No, but why? They will look for you. We only have a moment. You speak as if I'm a prisoner. Aren't you? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Come closer. And I'll explain. Explain what? Don't you know what they are? These men of God. They are mad, Mr. Ellington. All of them raving mad. Why do you say so? I was in the village, in Schwarzhof, doing nothing out of the ordinary, walking the street with my woman. We were holding hands. That is all. Do you see anything wrong with that? Well, of course not. But what... We pause to rest by a tree in the shade. And then we kissed. Yes, I admit it. Is it wrong to kiss? Tell me. Why, no, I don't think so. You don't think so. I don't think so. But Jerome, that lecherous old fool. The gaunt man, the one in charge. So, you have seen him. As I kissed her, a shadow fell over us. We looked up and saw him standing there. I opened my mouth to speak, but before I could utter a word, he raised the wooden staff he carries, so heavy. You've seen it? Yes. And he hit me again and again. He smote me <laughs> like an angry god or a man who thinks he's god. I woke up here. No. I swear, they flogged me with knotted ropes. I asked for food, they would not give it to me. I begged for water, they gave me none. Then they threw me in this filthy room and locked the door. Whoa. Why? For revenge. Jerome wanted my woman. Are you sure? Yes. That disgusting old man, that fanatic. He wanted her. And when she refused... His advances, he took his fury out on me. Uh, your story, I find it difficult to believe. Of course you do. That's the strength of the man. He makes his madness seem a harmless thing. The beliefs of a religious zealot. But this, this is not a religious order, Mr. Ellington. These brothers of truth. Is that what they're called? That's what they call themselves. The real truth is... They're outcasts, misfits, cut off from the world, because the world will not have them. Have you heard of their sect before, of this hermitage? No, I, I haven't. Mr. Ellington, you must believe me. I don't say they're all evil, only mad. And here, within these walls, they answer to no law but their own. Wait for me. Where are you going? I'll speak to Jerome. No, you mustn't. If I remind him that false imprisonment is a crime... I tell you, he's the greatest maniac of them all. Quick! He's coming. Hide yourself. 
Mr. Ellington. No, no. <laughs> Brother Jerome? I did not know you were well enough to walk. I, I still feel weak. Brother Jerome, come with me, please. Look here, I... This way. Where were you going? I was looking for you. It was unwise for you to wander on your own. The corridors can be treacherous. Oh, can they? In what way? The building is very old. One might trip and fall without a torch. Or go where one is not meant to go, is that it? See something perhaps that you're ashamed of? I do not know to what you refer. Don't you? Oh, then you don't know the grounds very well. I saw something just now that violates the law of this country and of humanity. I must ask you... And I must ask you, Mr. Ellington, to leave the Hermitage at once. We lack proper facilities to care for the ill. You certainly do. Arrangements can be made in Schwarzhof. Uh, just a minute. No, not a minute. Not an extra second, Mr. Ellington. Now. I thought you were concerned about my health. I am. But now you want me gone regardless. Why? I have explained that. You've explained nothing. Based on what I've seen, I question your motives. I question your entire operation here. You are making assumptions. I certainly am. Now, look, no one invited me to come here. I realize that. I arrived unexpectedly, and you're not prepared for visitors. But I had no choice. And there is no excuse for your behavior. I suppose it was only a matter of time before you brought out the knotted ropes so that you could flail me or whatever it is you do for amusement. My son. I'm not your son! There are many things you don't understand. That's right, I don't. So begin with this one. Tell me, why are you in such a hurry for me to leave? What more are you afraid I'll find out? More? Besides the man you've got locked up in that cell. What man is that, Mr. Ellington? The one we just left. The one who's been screaming his head off. I am not sure what you're talking about. That's it, isn't it, brother? Or is he only one of many? Well, it isn't a secret anymore. I know. And what do you think you know? I... Uh... <laughs> I... The chair. Sit. You are still weak. Brother Jerome, I know very little about this cult of yours. What's permitted within these walls, but I doubt very seriously that you can imprison a man against his will. That is quite true. We have no such authority. Then why have you done it? No man has ever been imprisoned at the Hermitage, Mr. Ellington. He claims otherwise. Who claims otherwise? Who do you think? The man in the cell at the end of the corridor. There is no man in the cell at the end of the corridor. I was talking with him. You are talking with no man. And you think I'm hallucinating? Mr. Ellington, you are ill. You still have a fever. In such a state, delirium may cause one to see and hear things that do not exist. Do you mean to tell me you don't hear that? Hear what? Look at me. Dreams can seem very real. And honest men make unconvincing liars. The brother who's been caring for me... Brother Christophorus? Yes. He has a way of looking at the floor when he tells me I'm imagining things. You look at me, but your voice loses its command. More imaginings. I, I don't know why, but you're both very intent on keeping me away from the truth. What do you know of the truth? Which is not only poor Christianity, Brother Jerome, it's poor psychology, because now I'm very curious indeed. Curiosity is a dangerous thing. Oh, I was taught it's a sign of intelligence. There are some things best left alone. Like sleeping dogs, a nest of snakes. I'll uncover the facts eventually, you know. Meaning what? Just what I say. I imagine 
the local police will be interested to learn that you're keeping a man locked up here. I tell you, there is no man. All right, let's forget it. I'll deal with it in my own way. And what way is that? However I see fit. It's no concern of yours now. Oh, and I apologize for not dying. Maybe some other time, brother. Mr. Ellington. A last word? Bon voyage? <laughs> Don't bother yourself. I'll make it to the village with no further delay. I assure you. Mr. Ellington, the, the prisoner in the cell, it's a delicate matter. Ah! So you admit it. A terrible thing. He's... Violent. Dangerous. More dangerous than you know. We are obliged to lock him in the cell. I am sure you can understand. I understand that you're still lying to me. Goodbye, Brother Jerome. Would you really go to the police? If you were in my place, wouldn't you? Very well. Close the door, Mr. Ellington. I have told you the truth, but only a part. Now I see that I must tell you the whole of it. May God forgive me. Then you do hear it. As I have heard it every hour of every day for five long years. Why did you lie? I didn't. Oh, but I think you did. And now the skies darken. The storm returns. I should have known. When I told you that no man screamed in the abbey, I spoke the truth. It is not a man, you see, Mr. Ellington. It is the devil himself. You're joking with me, aren't you? No, Mr. Ellington, I am not. Would that I were. It would be so much easier. But the prisoner in the cell, our only prisoner, is in fact Satan. Oh, come now. Otherwise known as the fallen angel, Ahriman, Asmodeus, Belial, Diabolus, the devil made manifest. You asked for the truth. Now you have it. Do you believe? What? Oh, sure. Hmm. Now it is you who are lying, Mr. Ellington. You don't believe me at all. To the contrary, you're even more certain of what you've suspected all along, that I am mad. Well, sit down. I will tell you a story. And then we'll see how certain you are of my madness or have anything else. Drink. Uh, what did you say? Some brandy. For thy stomach and thy infirmities. Uh, no, no, thank you. Don't worry. It's not poison. A very old vintage. I'll drink with you. What is it you wanted to tell me? I presume, Mr. Ellington, that you consider yourself sophisticated. A worldly man. Why do you say that? You're young. Rich by your clothes, and reasonably well-educated. Harvard? Yale. Exactly. Having a last fling before settling into the family business. How did you... You are an open book, printed in very large type, with pictures. Of course, you consider us primitive, because we're living in seclusion away from the real world. To you, we're misfits. Please, I know all the theories. I assure you, brother... No, Mr. Ellington. It is I who am assuring you that I am not the ignorant fanatic I might seem. I coped with your world for 40 years before I left it, and rather successfully by your standards. The best schools, a degree in philosophy, a job that took me to all the corners of the earth. This beard and this staff and this face represent nothing but a different point of view. If you understand that, then perhaps you will listen to what I have to say with an open mind. Go on. Five years ago, there were no screams at the Hermitage. This was simply the bombed out ruins of a castle belonging to the family Wolfren. How did you come by it? Baron Wolfren turned it over to the Brothers of Truth as a gesture of charity. Our task was to tend the great vineyards and save what souls we could by constant prayer. But this isn't a formal religious order, is it, brother? We believe that we are recognized by God. Truth is our only dogma. We are committed to it as man's greatest weapon against the devil, who is the father of all lies. Please, continue. You were 
tending the vineyards. At that time, not very long after the Great War, the world was in chaos. Everywhere there was unhappiness, except in the village below. Really? For some reason, the people of Schwarzhof refused to yield to despair. They lost none of their faith. They continued, as they had for years, to be honest and God-fearing and happy. The village was a plum to Satan, one he could not resist. So he came here, drawn to it as a moth is to light, and embarked upon a program of corruption. But you stopped him. Yes. You see, Mr. Ellington, he made the same mistake you are making now. He underestimated me. He thought he would have no difficulty tempting an old fool. I had him in the cell before he knew what happened. But if he's the devil, how do you keep him from escaping? With the staff of truth. The one barrier he cannot pass. Mm-hmm. And when he first came, just how did you recognize him? I had seen him before, in every part of the world. Wherever there was sin, wherever there was strife and persecution, there he was also. Sometimes he appeared only as a spectator, a face in the crowd. But he was always there, in all times and places. So you understand now, I trust, why you must say nothing of the things you have seen and heard. Brother, not that I doubt you, but is it possible that you've made a mistake? No. Think, Mr. Ellington, of the peace in the world these five years. Think of this country now. Is there another like it? But you haven't put an end to suffering. There's still murders and robberies. Even now, while we talk, people are starving. The suffering man was meant to endure, my son. We cause much of our own grief and need no help from him. It is the unnatural catastrophes, the great wars, the overwhelming pestilences, the wholesale sinning that we have ended. The world is rebuilding. A great dawn will come. E enough. You've made your case. I believe you, brother. Do you? Truly? I admit I was doubtful at first, but you've convinced me. Absolutely. I promise to keep your secret. Good. Tomorrow, if you feel well enough, you may leave. For now, let the storm pass over. Brother Christophorus will look after you. If you would, go directly to your room. I will. Good night, brother, and thank you. I was glad our conversation was over. It was clear that he was quite mad. I thought of his wild beard, his eyes in the flickering candlelight, and I was relieved to be away from him. The devil, indeed. But the storm had returned, and I was not yet fully recovered. I would pass one more night in this place. What, I wondered, should I do before morning comes? The corridor was dank and empty. I felt as though I were the last sane man in an insane world. What Brother Jerome had told me was utter nonsense, the product of a deranged mind. But his belief, his faith, as he called it, was heavy in the air, infecting the very stones. To bring it down would require outside help, but perhaps I could start that very night with an act of pure, unselfish humanity. Psst! Are you in there? Where else would I be? I thought you weren't coming back. I had a meeting with Brother Jerome. What did he say? He lied to you, didn't he? He said that you're... Go on. What? The devil. <laughs> the devil. Oh, oh, that's good. That's wonderful. What a dream for an old man. Himself a devil. To catch Satan and lock him away in this godforsaken place. You don't believe him, do you? Of course not. Then help me. If I let you out now, while they're awake, they may catch you before you leave the grounds. There's always the possibility. But another hour here, you don't know what it's like. Look here, why don't I just go and get the authorities? When? As soon as morning comes. 
I'll find the path to the village and... No! It would be my death warrant. The authorities will return and find nothing. Who knows what will have happened to me by then. Jerome is mad, but he's shrewd, too. He won't leave any evidence behind. Then... What can we do? You must let me out now. There doesn't seem to be a lock on your cell, only this small shepherd's staff. You could almost reach through the bars and remove it yourself. I've tried. It's wedged in such a way that I can't get my fingers around it. Here, I think I can get it. <clears throat> Quickly! Wait! Brother Christophorus! There you are. Brother Jerome was fearful. You might lose your way. No, no, nothing of the kind. Come along. I'll light the candle. There is bread and water on the table. And more soup to give you strength. Thank you. Rest now, Mr. Ellington. Remember, you're still a very sick man. I'm feeling much better. Nonetheless, Brother Jerome has asked me to watch over you. Really, that isn't necessary. It is my duty. The chair is sturdy, and the candle is fresh. Wait a minute. Why are you locking the door? To protect you. But you're locking us both in. Never fear. I have the key. It is not long till morning. But... Sleep, Mr. Ellington. You are a weary traveler. Soon you'll be back with your own kind. What a comfort, eh? You will forget all you have seen here. I watched the monk as he sat heavily in the chair. I was a prisoner, no doubt about it. How much longer, I wondered, for both prisoners. What if the morning came and Brother Jerome chose not to release me as he promised? I might remain here for... How long had the howling man been in prison? Five years? Lord, I imagined my beard growing, my hair wild, until I too was starved, crying to be let out, no one would come. Who knew I was here? I'd drop off the face of the earth, forgotten, presumed dead. Brother Christophorus had the keys around his neck, but until he fell asleep, I was at his mercy. It was almost dawn when I dared to move. I had to be careful not to wake him. Yes, I finally had the key. I locked Brother Christophorus in the cell. There was no time to spare. I knew I must release the howling man before I left the hermitage. You come. Good. What do you want me to do? Lift off the wooden bolt. Ah. Uh are you sure this is all that holds you in? A small carved stick? Yes, lift it off, I tell you. But surely you could have forced the door and broken it. Please! There is no time for talk in the name of mercy. If you fail now, they'll kill both of us. All right. Hurry. I'm trying. I just need to slide it. Oh, God, the latch. <sighs> Mr. Ellington, where have you gone? Hurry. Hurry. A moment. Stop him! Stop him! Now! Brother Jerome, come quickly! I am free. Stop! I command you! The other way! Now! Here is the gate. It's locked. I must get over the wall! I'll put my hands together. A hoist! Step up! Let not Satan escape us, O oh Lord. Let him not sow the seeds of evil throughout the world. I call upon you. Up! Now! stepped in my hands and climbed the gate. Now, reach down and give me your hand. Help me. Help you? Help you, mere mortal? <laughs> Are you mad? And I saw, not the foot of a man before me, but a cloven hoof in a flash of lightning with those horns grown suddenly from his forehead. Then he turned and vanished in the moonlight. I am sorry for you, my son. What was he? As long as you live, you will remember this night. He is gone. Who? Tell me. Even now, you're not sure. But you will be. And then you'll know, Mr. Ellington. You'll know who it was you loosed upon the world. <laughs> The monks 
were mad, I thought, or the howling man was mad, or I was, or the whole world. But Brother Jerome was correct. I could not forget. And when the pictures of the carpenter from Bromau Alm Inn appeared in the papers, I grew uneasy, for I felt I'd seen this man before. And when the carpenter invaded Poland, I was sure. And when the world was plunged into war and cities had their entrails blown asunder, and that pleasant land I had visited became a place of hate and death, I decided to spend the rest of my life tracking down the one I had released. Each night I dreamed of it, Mrs. Dunphy, and I kept dreaming through all the wars since, until this week. It took years, decades, but eventually I found him. And so the nightmare is finally over, again. I see. And now, Mrs. Dunphy, I'm going to see about a chartered plane to have him transported back to Germany. Brother Kostrophorus is in charge now. I have already written him. He will be very relieved. And what you found, it is here? Have no fear. As long as the Staff of Truth is in place, he cannot leave the next room. The Staff is very small, but very powerful. So you see why you must not, under any circumstances, go near that door. Nothing in the world is more important. Do you understand? I believe so. Oh, he'll do a bit of howling, but never mind that. It's a trick. I'll return as soon as possible. Until then, keep that door locked. Yes, sir. Oh, my. Such stories. Come here. Please. You must listen. He is insane. Let me out, I beg you. Let me out. Who's there? Behind that door. Are you all right? <coughs> Sir? Sir? Can you hear me? A little piece of wood. The staff. Remove it, please. I don't know if I should. Please, take it off the door. I implore you, please. Please. Ancient folk saying, you can catch the devil, but you can't hold him long. Ask Brother Jerome, or Brother Christophorus, or David Ellington. They know, and they'll go on knowing to the end of their days in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At TwilightZoneRadio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Howling Man, starring Fred Willard. With Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, David Darlow, Doug James, and Anna Sverutza. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcherson, 
Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exim Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. going, smart guy. <laughs> Hang on, Caesar. You'll see. Aha, uh -huh, that's a good one. Is it? You know I can't see nothing in here. Patience. What am I, a doctor? Very funny. At least try, will you? It's a virtue. What is? Patience. It means it doesn't come natural. You have to cultivate it like, uh, like a garden. What do you think? I grew on a tree? Don't answer that. Here we are. This will only take a minute. It better. I can hardly breathe. Quiet now, Caesar. We're going inside. Mommy, did you see that? See what, dear? That man with the suitcase. He was talking to himself. Shh, now, don't stare. But he was, honest. Come along, dear. Hi there, Freddy. Hmm? Oh, hello, Mr. West. Ah, you got a lot of new merchandise. Every day. Yeah, hey, look at all the TV sets and the watches. Is that a Rolex? Only a knockoff, I'm afraid. Something I can help you with? Well, now, the question is, can I help you? And you know, I might be able to do that little thing, seeing as how business is booming. Looks can be deceiving. What have you got for me today, Mr. West? Patience, my boy. I'll just be putting the case down, if you don't mind. Not on the counter, please. It's glass. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> hey, take it easy. Quiet, Caesar. What say? Oh, nothing. Nothing to tell. Now, where is it? Ah, right here in my pocket. Feast your eyes on this. Did you ever see such a timepiece? Well, to be honest... Been in the family for years. Three dollars. Surely you're joking. Five taps. Oh, now, you might want to put your glasses on. It's got a jeweled movement, a gold case and chain. Gold-plated. Well, nonetheless, it's... This is a real antique. You don't see watches like this anymore. True enough. People wear wristwatches nowadays. Listen, um... Freddy, I, I'm between engagements at the moment. It's strictly temporary. In fact, I, I have an audition this afternoon, a very important audition. Five dollars, Mr. West. Take it or leave it. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll, I'll take it. One, two, three, four, and five. Don't worry, your luck's bound to change. Sure it is, sure. Here's your pawn ticket. Don't lose it. I won't. We'll be back to claim it soon enough. We? Yeah, Caesar and me. We're a team, you know. I couldn't do the act without him. <laughs> that right. The watch. Please don't sell it. I'll do my best. For 30 days at least. Thank you. Kindly. Mr. West. Yes? What about him? Wait. You don't mean Caesar. I'll give you $25 for the dummy. With the case. All those stickers on it from all over the world. There are collectors, you know, for that sort of thing. Oh. Well, thank you. It's just the same, but... Uh... I'm afraid Caesar's not for sale. Mr. Jonathan West, ventriloquist, comedian and master manipulator of a dummy. A small splinter with large ideas, very aptly named Caesar. A wooden tyrant with a mind and a voice of his own. Only a few minutes from now, he'll do his best to talk Jonathan West into a brand new act to be performed exclusively in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Caesar and Me, starring Jason Alexander, 
with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hello, Mrs. Kadehi. Any mail for me? Ah, now what was that? <laughs> Got you. Ah, it's you, Susan. Huh, I thought a bee had stung me. Maybe it did. <laughs> This is the last time I'll warn you, child. Stop playing with poison darts. They're not poison, Aunt Agnes. It's only a pea shooter. Give it to me. I didn't hurt him. Good morning, Mrs. Goodday. No harm done. She, uh, she missed me. Now can I go out and play? Good morning, Mr. West. Off you go. I'll bet you didn't get a job. Well, now... Susan, go out and play. Yes, ma'am. See you later, Jonathan. Be gone with you, scat. Bye now. <laughs> She's a lovely child you have. I'm sorry, Mr. West. I don't know what I'm going to do with that girl. Oh, I understand, Miss Cadet. You certainly have your hands full with the room and house and all. That I do. No no mail, I presume? Uh, not yet. And uh, no calls? None at all. Well, then, I'll just go on up to my room, if you don't mind. Take him everywhere, do you? Oh, I try. Wouldn't do to go on an audition without Caesar, though, would it? I suppose not. Still, he must be awfully heavy. No, 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 no. He's light as a feather, he is. My old friend Caesar. <laughs> He's not heavy. He's my partner. <laughs> right, come along, Caesar. I'll make us a bite to eat. Won't that be lovely? Uh, oh, Mr. West, if I could have a word with you. Oh, yes, of course. Um, just let me take care of Caesar here. I'll be right down. Back safe and sound. Huh. About time. There you go. Watch your legs. Mighty stuffy in there. Is it? You're gonna have to get me some new summer clothes. I'm sweating pine sap. <laughs> See, sir, you're such a kidder. You are. Relax, why don't you? Better buy some new furniture while you're at it. A guy could get splinters sitting in a chair like this. Where'd you get it? Sing Sing? Ha, <laughs> that's a good one. Sing Sing. The chair, right? Yeah, I think I'll use that in the act. <laughs> what act? I ain't seen that audience since they invented vaudeville. Here's your slippers. I'll just uh, pull them on for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ain't you forgetting something? What's that? Oh, no, no, no. I didn't forget, Caesar. Here's your copy of Variety so you can keep up with the show business. This is last week's. Is it now? Ah, well, no. You see, the subscriptions run out. I, I've been meaning to renew it. See that you do. Right. I'll uh, I'll fix us some lunch. How's that sound? The least you can do. A guy deserves a little comfort once in a while. Well, that he does. Let's see here. Well, looks like it's soup today. Is that all you got? I'm afraid it's all that's left, Caesar. But don't you worry. We'll get a book in any day now. We'll be headliners. Yeah. Just like you and that other guy used to be. Only I won't skip out on you like he did. You better not. Or I'll... No, 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 no. No, I won't run off with some girly and leave you sitting in a pawn shop and a no, sir. You can count on me. It's you and me, pal. Forever. You got that right. Ah, the soup will hit the spot. Just a light lunch, you know what I mean? My mother used to say, never eat too much when you're hot and tired. Why don't you stop kidding yourself, buddy? How's that, Caesar? Face it. You're finished. Now, why would you go and say a thing like that? Because I can read the handwriting on the wall. You're going nowhere fast. No, but I told you, Caesar, we've got an audition this afternoon. Today's the day. I can feel it. We're going to knock them dead. Yeah, bore them to death. No, 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 no. You'll see. Wait till they hear the new material. We'll be going in a few minutes, just as soon as I put on my tie and come here. Wash your face while you're at it. You look like something the cat dragged in. Right. Good idea. <laughs> Ah, that feels much better. Who's that? Oh, ah, uh, it's you, Susan. Uh, you know, you, you, you really ought to, to knock first. I don't have to. This is my aunt's house. Well, just the same. Show me how to make him talk. Well, I, I'd like to, Susan, but we're on our way downtown. Show me. Oh, we've got an appointment, a very important appointment. An audition. Just do it once, Jonathan. The part where he laughs... I want to see what you do with your fingers to make his head move back and forth. Okay, Susan. Where are you going? 
to the mirror. I have to put on my tie. But you can't do it from over there. Sure I can. Just you watch. <clears throat> Caesar, what did the lady say she'd do with you if you misbehaved? She said she was going to slice me up into a Venetian blind. And what did you say? I said, oh, you make me shudder. There. How's that? I didn't see your lips move. That's right, you didn't. I'm the best there is. If you're so good, how come you can't get a job? All that's about to change, young lady. This very day. You said that before. Susan? Susan, where are you? You better run along. Susan! Coming! You won't get the job, I bet. Oh, now, Susan... Keep that brat out of this room. Don't listen to her, Caesar. You'll see. Today, we're gonna kill him. Um, now, Mr. Miller? Anytime. All right, then. If you're not ready... No, we're ready. Okay, Caesar. Quite stolen. <clears throat> uh, hello, Caesar. Hiya. I heard a new one the other day. That's a surprise. I wonder if I told it to you. Is it funny? <laughs> Yes, as a matter of fact. Then you didn't. Oh, hey, Caesar, I think I met your father the other day. Where? In a toothpick factory. Get out of here. No, oh, uh, um, excuse me, Caesar. It was a chopstick factory. A <laughs> chopstick factory. Or was it your mother? I thought you were the straight man. Well, um, Caesar, at least I can stand up straight. I'd like to see you stand up if I stick my mitt in your back. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to hurt you. Just watch what you're doing with those fingers, all right? Don't know where they've been. Well, let me give you a hand. <laughs> a hand, you see? He said... I is the microphone on? It's on. W would you like me to run through the juvenile delinquent routine? It's very funny, if I do say so. That'll be all. B um, but, but you haven't heard the last part? No, but I've heard the first part, and it's more than enough. We'll be in touch. Oh. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Miller, I'll, I'll leave my phone number, if it's all right with you. Sure thing. Next... Must have had a fight with his wife this morning. Or maybe he got a new hearing aid so he could hear your crummy jokes. Come on, Caesar. We're going home. There. That ought to do it. Clean shirt, tie all pressed. The suit's just about had it, though. Pardon me for asking a stupid question, but what are you so chipper about? You'll see. Tomorrow. Another lousy audition? Nope. Not this time. I am not talking about a nightclub job. Well, what in blazes are you talking about? I've been thinking, Caesar, and I came up with a plan. Oh, a plan, huh? You'll see. This one may change our lives. Okay. Surprise me. But I'll bet my bottom dollar that whatever it is, it flops. <laughs> Don't you have any faith in me? Why should I? I know you. Stick by me one more time, will you, buddy? Just this once. Things will change, I promise. I swear it. Give me one more chance. Okay? Okay. Once more. But that's it. You get one last shot. After that, we do things my way. As far as I'm concerned, you're living on borrowed time. You get me, buddy? Good morning, Mrs. Gadehi. Yes, it is. Oh, oh, Mr. West. Hmm? There's something I'd like to talk to you about. I know, Mrs. Gadehi, the rent. I'm sorry to mention it. Well, you'll be pleased to know I'll be able to straighten it out this evening. Oh, that would be very nice. Yes, indeed. I've made a decision. I'm going to look for a day job. Really? Something temporary, you understand, until the show business picks up. I think that's a splendid idea. In that case, as long as you're in this frame of mind, maybe I can help. I've been saving something for you. Um, here, take this card. Card? My cousin's. He works at an employment office. You don't say. Active Employment Agency. If we can't place you, there are no jobs. <laughs> it's clever. 
Well, thank you, Mrs. Cadehi. You're a living doll. <laughs> You're welcome, Mr. West. It's not far. You can walk there from here. Just turn right at the first corner, then go five or six blocks. You can't miss it. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, well then, I might as well go there right now. Why not? First stop of the day. You do that. And good luck, Mr. West. I really mean it. The very best of luck to you. Well, here's an application for him. Thank you, Mr. Smiles. Uh, but we should be able to cut through some of this, seeing as how you know Jeannie. Well, I should hope so. Typing. How's that? How many words a minute? I'll fill it in for you. W uh, well, now, uh... No typing. Well, how about sales? Um, how do you mean? Oh, you know, retail, commission, that sort of thing. Hmm. Uh, to be honest... Go on. Uh, not really... I see. Um, any uh, mechanical aptitudes? You mean in the sense of machinery? Exactly. Uh, appliances, automobiles, and, and, and so forth? Yes. Uh, well, in that case, Mr. Smiles, uh, no. Food preparation, perhaps. Uh, restaurant work, service industries. Not that I can recall. Mr. West, have you ever held a position of any sort? ever made any kind of a regular salary at any time in your life, at any time at all. That is, besides show business. Oh, yes. Doing what, may I ask? I, uh, well, I once worked in an office. Well, that's a start. Uh, in an office building, actually. As? An elevator operator. Hmm. You know, Mr. West, most all buildings today have automatically controlled stop and start systems. Aye, aye, aye. True enough. So there's simply no call for elevator operators nowadays. No, uh, of course not. There wouldn't be, would there? I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do for you right at the moment. I see. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, but if you leave your name with the receptionist, uh, I'll be in touch. Yes, yes, uh, I'm sure you will. can't find a job. Okay, Susan, that's enough. The truth hurts, doesn't it? What do you know about the truth? You're scared to tell my aunt because you're behind in your rent. Look, why don't you go outside and play? Jonathan's broke. Jonathan's broke. Well? Well, what? I see. It's like that, is it? I told you so. Please, Caesar. Now what? I don't know. No matter what I do, it doesn't work out. Eh, what else is new? If I could just get some money together. Not much. Enough for the rent and some food. Then I'd be able to think clearly without these pressures. Just a little money for rent and food, huh? Chump change. Is that all you want out of life? Right now, that'll do. You're a clod. You're a real potato head. I try. I'll give it my best. Your best stinks. I can't even remember my lines anymore. I shake so bad my lips move. Tell me something I don't know for a change. That's it. Caesar, I'll give up. I've had enough. I'm the one who's had enough. Get that through your thick skull. You? Let me spell it out for you. The cold, hard facts. I think I already know. This is the way it's gonna be, and what you're gonna do. Save your breath. I'm a failure. Will you shut up and listen? There are more ways than one to skin a cat. Meaning? You dummy. I'm talking about money. Cash. Moolah. There are other ways to get a hold of it. I've tried everything. You have not tried everything. Now dummy up. While I lay it out for you. Where are we now? In front of the furniture store. I don't mean that stupid. I mean how far away from the delicatessen. That's so loud. Why? Is anybody around? No. I followed the plan. You remember the plan, don't you? I don't know about this, Caesar. Will you cross the street? Tell me when we're in front of our mark. All right, all right, but please be quiet. Hey! 
What's going on? I lost my footing on the curb. The street lamp is out. Good. That's a break. Are we on the sidewalk now? Now we're in front of the... the deli. All the lights off inside? Aye, all off. Is the coast clear? Yes, yes. There's no one coming in either direction. Okay. You know what to do. Stop wasting time. Move already. Are you sure about this? Sure, I'm sure. Take the hammer out of your pocket. That's it. Now do it! You didn't tell me there'd be an alarm! Get inside before somebody sees you. Oh! Now you've got it, buddy! Go for the kiss, register! Ha ha ha! We're in business! Ha 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 ha! Eighty-three, eighty-four, eighty-five. There you are, Mrs. Kadehi, all paid up. Oh, my, my, isn't it nice to pay one's bills? The nicest, ma'am. The best way to start a grand new morning. Better count it again, Aunt Jean. Now, no need for that. I don't trust him. See if it's real. Now, Susan, be a good girl and go tidy up your room. Don't be fresh to Mr. West. He made a new start in life, haven't you, Mr. West? Ah, sure enough. A new start. Jonathan has a job? I don't believe it. Oh, pay no attention to her, Mr. West. You know how children are these days. Yes, yes, I understand. Now, if you've no objection, I'll be going on to my room. I want to get these groceries put away. Surely. See you later, Mr. West. No doubt. believe it. Nothing but a lousy thief. <laughs> what a way to make a living. You couldn't make it any other way. What's happened to me? What am I? A no-talent guy who throws his voice. That's worse than that. A second-rate burglar. Third-rate. Starving to death in the only profession I know, paying the bills by robbing a restaurant. Well, that's showbiz. Jonathan? Now who is he talking to? Worse, I guess. I wasn't so bad, considering it was my opening performance. Before you start taking too many bows, let me straighten you out. Oh, ease off, will you, Caesar? Not a chance. You're running out of time. Let me spell it out. You act penny ante because you think penny ante. That's the story of your life. From now on, you're gonna listen to me. We're moving up to the big time. Big time? Last night was just for openness. Tell me something. Your dream was always to play the palace, right? Well, sure. Okay, buddy. Stick with me. Get ready! For what? You're gonna play the palace after all. From now on, you're on top of the bill. Strictly... Big time! The way you make it sound, I don't know if I like it. Oh, you'll like it, all right. You're going to be a star, buddy boy. Nothing but first class all the way. Top of the world, pal. <laughs> Top of the world. <laughs> Oh, Mrs. Kadehi. Yes? I'll be going out now. What's that? Just for a few minutes. If I get any calls, take down the number, will you please? Surely, Mr. West. Have a pleasant afternoon. Where are you going, Jonathan? Out of the way, Susan. You better be nice to me or I'll tell my aunt. Tell her what? Oh, things. I know what you're doing. You do, huh? And what's that? I heard you talking in your room. I wasn't talking to anyone. Yes, you were. You and Caesar. Now listen, you little... Susan. Susan, please. You, you, you know it isn't nice to eavesdrop on people. Stay away from me. I'm not going to hurt you. But you shouldn't pry into other people's business. You, you don't know what you might find. Like what? Well, never you mind. 
Now, I'm going out to buy the morning paper, and when I get back, maybe I will teach you the art of ventriloquism. <laughs> That's what you want to know, isn't it? Won't that be fun? That's what you said before. But this time, I mean it. You'll see. Now, you, you be a good girl. I'll be right back. Susan, is that you? Yes, Aunt Jean. Come here and help me. In a minute. Be right there. He's so dumb. He forgot to lock his door. Doesn't he ever clean this place up? There you are, Caesar. Sitting in that chair like you're real. Well, you're not. You're a dummy. Where'd you get that cigar? Don't you know there's no smoking? I'll get rid of it for you. Look at your little clothes in the closet. Think you're pretty smart, don't you, Mr. Stuckup? You better answer me or I'll wreck all your stuff. Come on, say something. I dare you. Uh-oh, here he comes. Well, just you wait. I'll be back. I know you can talk. I heard you. Hello, Jonathan. Susan. I gotta go. Wait a minute. You weren't in my room, were you? Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. Why's the door open? I'll tell my aunt. Didn't she teach you to stay out of other people's rooms? What were you doing in there? Wouldn't you like to know? You little brat. Tell me. Why don't you ask him? Caesar, what happened? Your cigar, what did she do to you? Never mind. First things first. Where's my paper? Here. Open it for me. Later. We've got to get out of this place. Calm down, jerk. I mean it, Caesar. She knows too much. Hang on. After tonight's job, we'll be on Easy Street. I told you, I'm not cut out for this line of work. Will you cool it? You're eating better, aren't you? You're paying the rent? Where were you before? Nowhere. Now listen to me. This is the big one. The really big show. This is the last time for me. The end. Sure. Sure it is, pal. Now, I got it all worked out. Here's what we do. All clear so far. There's nobody in the club. Then get a move on. Where? Mike, I told you, the front office. What's that? Nothing. Probably a mouse. Is that what you are? A mouse? Caesar, please. I'm doing my best. Then stop shaking. You make me nervous. Keep walking. Backstage, remember? I got it. Where are we now? I think this is the door. Use the flashlight. What does it say? Manager? Bingo! Now hurry up. I'm trying. And don't forget, if the night watchman shows up, stay cool. You're looking for Mr. Miller. You were supposed to meet him here. Use the screwdriver, then the ice pick. Nice and slow, like I told you. Look, suppose I can't open it. You opened the back door, didn't you? This is a different kind of lock. I can't, Caesar. Stop whining. You want to be poor again? There. Now go on in. Go! I don't know a thing about safe cracking, Caesar. Put your ear to it. Turn the dial till it clicks. Patience, buddy, patience. I'm not sure. That's it. Now reverse. That a boy. Pull the handle and you're ready. Will you look at all that money? Never mind the coins. Grab the real dough. All right, all right. Now let's get out of here. Hold on. Who's there? Uh... It's just me, um, Jonathan West, ventriloquist. Oh, you remember me? Can't say as I do. Uh, Mr. Miller told me to meet him here after the club closed, but I, I, I guess I missed him. Already gone, has he? That's right. Oh, well, then uh, I'll just be on my way. Uh, hold on. Uh, what's in the case? Uh, this. Wait, uh, you remember Caesar, <laughs> don't you? Caesar, say hello to the, to the nice gentleman. Howdy doody, Your Honor. Oh, sure. From the other day, the audition. Yeah, Mr. Miller left about 15 minutes ago. Did he know? Uh, well, um, I'll give him a call. I would now like to give you my impression of the great Jimmy Cagney. Oh, dirty rat. 
Come on, Kappa. You, you're the guy. The guy who killed my brother. Never mind, Caesar. We, we won't be holding you up any longer. Sure thing. <laughs> Some act you got there, mister. Ain't you gonna count the money? That was close. Too close. What are you doing? You're not going to bed, are you? The night still got braces on its teeth. I'd feel a whole lot better if that watchman hadn't shown up. Stop worrying. I'll cover for you. I'm your alibi. But if he reports me... Not you, pal. Us. We're a team. I'm behind you all the way. Sure, sure, I know. But what if... Shut up about it already. All right, you want to turn in? Go ahead. Get your rest. You're gonna need it. Tomorrow's a whole new day. We'll be living the high life. From here on out. Here, Susan, eat your breakfast. Aunt Jean? Every bit of it. Aunt Jeanie, can I see the paper? You can read the funnies later. Not the funnies, the front page. Now, what would you want to see that for? Drink your orange juice. If I do... No deals, you're a growing girl. Hmm, what's this? Karaoke club robbed last night... Thieves loot manager's office. Saints preserve us. It's just as well you don't read the paper, child. How are you coming with your eggs? Susan? Susan? Susan, come here this minute. Hello? Police department? You better come quick. I know who robbed the karaoke club last night. Eat up, pal. I'm not hungry. Not even for steak and eggs? You must be sick. Let me feel your head. When I think of what it took to buy that steak, it makes me lose my appetite. You like a roof over your head, don't you? I'm a thief. Plain and simple. Here we go again. A man has to live with himself, even if it's in the gutter. Go on. And you're going to answer the door? I knew it. What am I going to do? Mr. West! Relax, buddy boy. Oh, hello, Mrs. Uh, Mr. West. These two gentlemen, they're from the police. They'd like a word with you. Why, of, of course. Jonathan West? Yeah, that's, that's me. Um, what can I do for you? Well, it has to do with... Thank you, ma'am. We'll handle it. What seems to be the problem, officers? We'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Of course. I'll just be downstairs. Would you mind waiting a moment, ma'am? You may be of some help. Glad to. Uh, Mr. West is one of my favorite boarders. Here, yeah, Mrs. Cadet, uh, please sit down. Sorry, I'm a, a little short of chairs. <laughs> it's just a room for one, me and my friend here. But it suits us fine, doesn't it, Caesar? Say hello to the gentleman. Mr. West, where were you last night about midnight? Where was I? Uh, well, that's easy. Right here, same as always. Was I, Mrs. Gadehi? Well, I do know that you don't usually go out in the evening, but I couldn't say for certain. The sergeant down at the desk received an anonymous phone call. Said we should talk to you. Why? I never go out that late. <laughs> we were here all night, weren't we, Caesar? You didn't go to the karaoke club? You mean the nightclub? Because the watchman said he saw you there. Tell them, Caesar. Tell them. Who's he talking to? The dummy? Please, Caesar, tell them. Tell them how we wanted to play the palace. Mr. West. You don't believe me? Ask him. Caesar, tell them how we we tried to get a job. We had nothing to eat. The, the rent was overdue, wasn't it, Mrs. Cadehi? Oh, Mr. West. Caesar, please tell them so they'll understand what a failure I am. How you tried to help me. I'm not really a thief. Caesar, you're the smart one. I'm, I'm down on my knees. I'm begging you. Tell them. Stand up, Mr. West. You better come with us. But Caesar, you said it was the two of us from now on. That's what he said. I swear. He said we were a team. Come on with us, Mr. West. We need to take you down to the station. Oh, he's always been such a decent man. He's a no-good crook, isn't he, Caesar? Come on. You don't have to pretend. I won't tell. I promise. 
Look at this mess. Who's going to take care of you now, Caesar? Okay, go ahead. Act like you don't hear me. I don't care. You won't even turn your head or blink your eyes. All right, be that way. Just remember, I know you can talk. Because I heard you last night. Psst. Hey, you. Caesar? Yeah, you. Come on back, honey. I knew you talked. I knew it. And I know you finked on him. Pretty smart. The way you made that call. You're a hip little kid. I like you. Lean down. I want to ask you something. What? You like living here with your aunt? That's a stupid question. I bet you'd like to run away from this flea trap. Okay. Listen. From now on, it's you and me. We'll go to New York. I'll show you the bright lights. I know where the money is. What do you say? Well, you are kind of cute. Don't forget the suitcase. It's a deal, Caesar. Come on. Just you and me, kid. The big time. We're a team, see? A team. An unlikely pair. A little girl and a wooden doll. A lethal dummy carved in the shape of a man. This is just a fantasy, of course, because everybody knows dummies can't talk unless they happen to learn their vocabulary in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at TwilightZoneRadio.com. Caesar and Me, starring Jason Alexander with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for the Twilight Zone by Adele T. Strassfield. Heard in the cast were Zanny Laird, Meg Falcon, Rich Komenik, Lisa Joyce, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Roderick Peoples, C.J. Amari, Lynn Foley, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Paper! 
Get your afternoon paper. Many are dying and many are dead. Oh, hi, Miss Maitland. Hello, Vincent. How are you today? Can't complain. Paper? Of course, a paper. What would Daddy say? Well, maybe he'd be better off. Not much good news today. Oh, I'm sure you're mistaken about that. Take a look around. Isn't it a beautiful day? If you say so, Miss Maitland. Paper, get your paper here. Hey. Hey, you with the rich boyfriend? Don't be so stuck up. Sal. Come on. Just because I'm a big success now, that don't make me stuck up. Whose convertible is that? Oh, it couldn't be mine, huh? Just like that. I asked you a question, Sal. Whose is it? A guy named Halper. Halper. He's about 174 years old, and he owns half of Connecticut. <laughs> Can you imagine wheels like this, wasted on a creep who's all ready to get planted? How do you know him? I got me a new job, washing cars in his building, and I noticed this gadget was getting anxious for some action. I'm serious. The battery could have run down. He doesn't know you have it. What's the difference? He wants to go somewhere. He's got a chauffeur. Drives him around in a big black battleship. He doesn't use this baby once a month. So you took it. I borrowed it. It's okay, honest. He digs me. I've been doing little favors for him. He wouldn't care. Come on, get in. Thanks anyway, Sal. I'm not lying. The only time old man Halpert uses this is to go to try to pick up chicks. Reminds him of when he was a kid or something. Sal, I'm tired. I've been at work all day. So what? And I promised Dad I'd stay home with him tonight. Ah, for the love of. Bye, Sal. Okay, okay. Watch how I can make nice. Gee, uh, that's too bad. So, I'll borrow the wheels again Friday night and pick you up. Okay? Now, wasn't that polite? Just like one of those college boys? Sal, I meant what I said last time. No, you didn't. I don't think we should see each other anymore. What's that supposed to mean? I shouldn't have let it get started in the first place. Yeah, so long as you're the saintly social worker and I'm one of the crumbs, then it's okay, ain't it? It's only when we get real close. You notice I got dirt on my hands. You know that has nothing to do with it. Plus, I don't talk like your old man. I've tried to explain. We're just not two people who. Two people who could ever get along with all the education you got. You ought to be able to swing a better dear John than that. I'm sorry, Sal. Listen. I ain't always gonna have dirt on my hands, and I don't need books to tell me which way is up. I know the map, and I'll get there. You'll see. Is anything wrong, Leah? No, nothing, Dad. Nothing at all, Dad. I heard your voices. Hello, Sal. I'll wheel you back in. That won't be necessary. I can do it. Feel better now that you finally convinced her she's too good for a bum like me. Sal, I won't pretend that I. Pick you for my daughter, I wouldn't. But ultimately, it's not my decision; it's hers. I'm willing to admit I may have been wrong about you. She's obviously seen you quite differently from the way I have. Not anymore. Come on, Daddy. I'm sorry, Sal. Just once in my life, why can't I want something and get it? Just once. Ow! My hand. Ah, my hand. Confidential personnel file on Salvador Ross. Personality: a volatile mixture of fury and frustration. Distinguishing physical characteristics: one badly broken fist, injured by striking a closed door, and requiring emergency treatment at the nearest hospital. Ambition: shows great determination for self-improvement. Estimate of potential success: a sure bet for the latest edition of Who's Who. Published in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story: the self-improvement of Salvador Ross, starring Luke Perry with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Blue team, I see you. Please, blue team, I see you. City Hospital Emergency Room. That would be general admissions. I'll transfer you. Emergency, please hold. 
There, I filled out your forms. Now can I see a doctor? Take a seat, sir. I already took a seat 45 minutes ago. Is your name on the list? Yeah, right there. See? Ross. R-O-S-S. -S. Well, you'll have to wait your turn, Mr. Ross, like everybody else. How long? I'll call you. When? A doctor will be with you as soon as possible. Hey, I got me a busted hand here. I'm in pain. So is everyone else in this waiting room. Now, if you won't sit down and wait your turn... When is my turn, huh? Next week? Next year? I've been waiting as long as I can remember for somebody to pay attention. I got problems too, you know. I ain't some mug off the street. Lower your voice, or I'll call security. Go ahead, call him. If that's what it takes to get respect around here... Security to the front desk, please. Who's next, Miss Olson? Oh, doctor, I was just... Something the matter? This patient doesn't want to follow procedure. Damn right I don't. What are you running here, a hospital or a torture chamber? I got me a little problem, and if you don't want to do something about it... What's the injury? His hand. You see this? I got broken bones in there. If you'd ever busted your hand, you'd know what I'm talking about. Hmm. Abrasions on the knuckles. In a fight, were you? Forget it. I'm getting out of here. Hold on. I said don't worry about it. Are you in serious pain? Oh, you don't think I can take it? I ain't some wimp. All right, clean up the abrasions, then send them down for an x-ray. Yes, doctor. This way, Mr. Ross. Now, who's next? Miller? Here we are, Mr. Ross. What's this, the charity floor? The orthopedic ward is full, but you'll be fine in here for tonight. You're sharing with, let me see, Mr. Armstrong. Hey, Sonny. Hi yourself, old man. I'll put your clothing bag in the closet. Bet if I was some rich guy, I'd have my own private room, right? It's just for one night. Look, why don't you let me go on home? The doctor has to prepare the cast after he's seen the x-rays in the morning. For now, the splint will have to do. Just don't put any pressure on it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. You adjust the bed with these buttons. If you need anything, press this one for the nurse's station. <sighs> right. Good night, Mr. Ross. Hey, nurse. Yes? What's the button for, room service? The button for... Chow. What's the guy got to do to get a burger and fries up here? Oh, you mean dinner. Uh, food services will be by any time now. Good. That's okay, then. Good night again. Mind if I watch my program? Be my guest. Do something to your hand. No, I just stopped in for a good night's sleep. The Waldorf was getting on my nerves. <coughs> I bet it hurts. You got that right. Don't worry. They bring you pills every few hours. <laughs> Great. You're lucky, though. Yeah, I ought to be on TV. No, <clears throat> I'm serious. <clears throat> I've got this congestion in my chest. You griping about a cold? At your age, it might be just a cold. At mine, it could turn into pneumonia. Excuse me while I turn on the tears. You should appreciate what you got. Know something, boy? You could break both legs and you'd be running the 100-yard dash inside a month. Yeah? Well, if you think this feels so great, let's swap. You take the broken hand. I'll take your lousy cold. <laughs> it's a deal. <coughs> Knock yourself out, old man. I'm gonna catch some Z's. Mr. Ross? Are you awake? Yeah. I brought your pain pill. Goody. You've been a good boy. You didn't ring for more medication. I must have fell asleep. I'll leave your pills on the side table. Thanks. Doctor will be in in the morning. Till then, get some rest and be careful of that splint. Yeah, right. Hey, what's going on? My hand don't hurt anymore. I didn't even take the pill. <coughs> Old man. Old man. What? Oh, my hand. What's the matter with my hand? Hurts, huh? Oh. Sure it does. <clears throat> and me. All I got's a head cold. Some bargain we made, huh, Pops? Oh, no, please. I want to swap back. Uh, sorry. All deals are final. Please. 
It'll never heal. Not at my age. Well, later, Pops. <clears throat> I'm gonna put my clothes on and blow this joint while the going's good. There you go. One draft. Thanks, Dan. Uh, can you put it on my tab? Afraid not, Billy. Cash on the barrelhead. But you know I'm good for it. Sure you are. And I'm on Donald Trump's payroll. Can't do it, Billy boy. Been a slow night. All right. Hey. How you doing, Sal? Yeah. Five by five all the way. Say, Stan, why don't you help me try something? What's that? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. How much money you got in the till? Sorry, Sal. No touches today. <coughs> That's a pretty bad cough. Don't worry. It's getting better already. And I don't want no loan. That's a relief. So, uh, how much you got? I don't know. A uh, bill and a half, maybe? Bill and a half. Okay. It'd be worth uh, 150 for you to have, I don't know, say, to have hair again? To have what? You heard me. Hair. A big old thick head of hair, like mine. Sal, whatever you've been drinking, you didn't get it here. But listen to me. I'm just asking you a question. If this is a rib, I don't like it. I know. But this is no joke. Let's say I could give you a full head of hair again. Would you pay me what's in the drawer? Sure, Sal. And if you get me in the movies while you're at it, I'll give you a bonus. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. Now you agreed to it. The deal's set. <laughs> so when do I collect the fur? I don't know exactly, but I swear, you'll get it. Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross, you have a telephone call. Sal, are you in there? Yeah, Mrs. Olaf. There's a phone call for you. Please tell your friends not to call in the middle of the night. There's a limit. Okay. I was sound asleep. You're not the only one. Why, Sal, what what happened to your... Hello? Yeah, this is me. Stan? I know. Never mind, Hal. You got what you wanted, didn't you? I said it ain't your business, Hal. Good. Well, tell her to run her fingers through it. I'll be by in the morning to collect. Bye. From now on, no calls after 10 o'clock, and... Sal, what have you done to yourself? Shaving your head like... like one of those gang boys. If you only knew how ridiculous you look that way. Why, why where are you going? Do you know what time it is? I gotta go out. Out of my way, cat. Who's there? Does somebody want to roll me? Well, I ain't got nothing, so leave me alone. Billy, I thought that was you. What are you doing here, Sal? To tell the truth, I was looking for you. What for? How's Stan doing? Oh, Stan? He's great. Oh, you should have seen him. Once it happened, he called free drinks all around. You mean his hair? That's right. Uh, I took me a little nap, and when I woke up, he must have had a wig or something. So happy to have hair he could spit. How'd he look? Oh, like a new man. Hey, Sal, what happened to you? Is something wrong with your head? It looks like you shaved yours. You like the way Stan looked, Billy? No, you wouldn't. You got yourself a nice full head of hair, thick and black. Same as mine used to be. Of course, it could use a good washing, but that's no problem. What are you talking about? Oh, nothing much. Just a little deal between you and me. Strictly business. Could you use some extra money, Billy? Sure. Because I'm about to come into some cash, as soon as I see Stan. If you want, I could see my way clear to let you have, say, 75? How does 75 bucks sound? In exchange for something you won't even miss. Just think. You won't have to worry about combing it or anything anymore. Say what?
afternoon, Mr. Halper. Park it for me, Sal. You got it, sir. And no dents. This car cost me plenty. It sure must have. Don't you worry. <laughs> Here, give me a hand. Here you go, Mr. Halper. You had to drive yourself today? I didn't have much choice. But he's got to have a day off. After this, if that chauffeur wants to work for me, he can buy George work seven days or none at all. You know, I'd be glad to drive you any time, Mr. Halpern. Hmm? Yes. Traffic's bad these days. Full of madness. It sure is. Here's the elevator. I was hoping for a chance to talk to you. About what? I've got... Well, you might say I've got something to sell. Anything worth buying? I've already got it. Hiya, Mr. Halpert. Going up? Yes, Andrew, all the way. And no stops. No stops it is. Not this, you haven't. Haven't what? Hold the door for me, Andrew. Yes, sir. You haven't got what I'm selling. Well, what is it? Something you can't buy anywhere else in the world, from anyone else but me. You'll say it's the best purchase you have ever made in your life. The best, Mr. Halpert. Get in, we'll talk. No problem. The penthouse, Andrew. That's what I figured, sir. Now as to this item you mentioned. As I recall, you've not seen my apartment before. That's right, I haven't. It's, uh, quite a pad, Mr. Halpert. And a strange one for a man of my age. Is that what you're thinking? You mean the modern art and everything? Oh, no, I always figured you still knew how to swing. I keep it this way for my new friends. <laughs> I bet you really wow the chicks, don't you, sir? Well, let's see it. What? This marvelous item you think I should purchase. You're looking at it, Mr. Halpert. What am I looking at? Youth. That's what I want to sell you. All right, boy, that's enough. Get out of here. I know it sounds wild, but I mean it. Sir, I'm telling you the absolute truth, and you can take that to the bank. I warn you, if you have any half-headed idea of robbing me, the security devices I've installed... I ain't interested in robbery. I don't have to be. I'm telling you, I got something to sell. Something that you want more than anything else. <laughs> you, eh? So you bottle it? Is that it? Some sort of tonic? If you'll just give me a chance. Now. I read in the paper where you're 76 years old. That's correct. I'm 26. Congratulations. Now, if you don't mind... What would you give to be 26 again, Mr. Halper? I'm beginning to think you're the craziest kid they ever let out onto the streets. Okay. Think that. Just play along with me for a minute. It ain't gonna hurt you one bit. Now, what would you give? Let's say... a million dollars? All right, let's say a million dollars. I'd gladly give that to be 26 again, if such a thing were possible. Tell me about this pad. What about it? You own it? Of course I own it. I don't see what that has to do with... Would you throw it in? What? Into the deal. Just how do you propose to deliver this fountain of youth you're raving about? By selling you years. My own years off of my life. <laughs> well, boy, I'll tell you what you do. You gift wrap those ears and mail them to me. Just be sure you don't send them COD. For now, if you don't mind, I'll show you the door. The apartment. You didn't say. Is it part of the deal? Uh, why, of course it is. I wouldn't want to take your years for a penny less than they're worth. A million dollars. And this apartment? Done. What is? You just bought yourself 50 years. <laughs> I'm sure I did, boy. Uh, no, you're not sure. But trust me, Mr. Halpert, you've got a pleasant surprise coming real soon. It's open. Here's that newspaper you ordered. Come in, Andrew. You know my name? Sure. Sure I do. Mr. Halpert told me about you. He did, huh? Oh, you must be the new owner of this place. That's right. Did we ever meet before? I don't think so. Funny, you look kind of familiar. Oh, I've been staying in, but I know you run the elevator. Yep, that's me. 
Hey, what happened to old man Halpert? I mean, uh, Mr. Halpert. He decided to take a long cruise. Oh. With some young friends of his. And, and since he planned to be away for a long time, he agreed to lease me this place. Yeah, that sounds like Mr. Halpert. How do you mean? Well, he sure knows how to spend money. Except when it comes to tipping, that is. And you need your tips, don't you? You're not kidding. Nobody could make it in this building without him. Drink? Ah, uh, no thanks. I'm working. How much do you make a week? Well, I'd be embarrassed to tell you, but it's sure not that much. Without tips, it doesn't go very far. This should help, then. A picture of Andrew Jackson? Just for bringing the paper? Mister, I have a feeling you're gonna get good service around here. Real good. Hey, if there's anything you ever need, just ask for me. Wait a minute. Yeah? How'd you like to make some more money? Quite a bit more. Sure, uh, as long as it's legal. How old are you? Nineteen. Would you like to be twenty? Huh? It's only a year, right? Oh, I'll figure I'll make it one of these days. Sure. You've got plenty of time. No rush. What would you say if somebody offered to buy a year of your life for as much as you can earn in a few months? Right now, so you wouldn't have to wait for the money. If somebody said that to me, well, I guess I'd tell them to take a flying leap at the moon. You wouldn't sell a year for all that money? Think of what you could do if you had it. Well, it's like this. I guess I enjoy being this age. They say you only go around once. True. The days can get pretty boring, but there are some nights I wouldn't swap for anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Nice talking to you, sir. Uh, be seeing you. Wait. Yeah? Come back for a minute. Yes, sir. Come in. Close the door. Okay. You thought I was joking, didn't you? I, I don't think I get what you're talking about exactly. Here. This should make it clear. What's your full name? Andrew Grow. You can fill that in yourself. Now, does this make it a little more reasonable? Mister, this is a check for $10,000. That's right, Andrew. What do I have to do? I told you. Nothing. If you take it, you'll wake up a year older tomorrow, that's all. And you'll have a whole lot more money to spend. I guess so. Think of what you could do with it. Dates, nightclubs, anything you like. Now, tell me the truth. Do you really care whether you're 19 or 20? Does 12 months make that much of a difference? Well, when you put it that way, I guess 20's a pretty good age. Just as good as 19. Maybe better. Then you've made a deal, Andrew. A very good one. Be careful with that check till you get to the bank. Sure. Uh, nice doing business with you, Mr... Mr... Ross. And Andrew. You might pass the word along to your friends. I'm always good for cash. On the same terms. Oh, they'll be beating down your door. Who knows? I might decide to sell you a couple more years myself. I'll be here. And thank you, Andrew. Nice doing business with you, too. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Ross. My pleasure. Believe me, the pleasure's all mine. Yes? Who is it? Give me a moment. Sal. Hello, Mr. Maitland. Is Leah home yet? No, she isn't. What are you... You don't mind if I wait, do you? You're certainly looking successful. We haven't seen you for quite some time. Well, you see, I've been busy, Mr. Maitland, moving up, making myself worthy of your daughter. You should be happy. Do something for me, Sal. As a favor, please, leave her alone. Come on, look. The fingernails are clean now. Manicured, even. I've got the right shoes, the right clothes. Yes, you certainly do. I told you I was going to improve myself, and I always keep my word. You're obviously doing very well, Sal. And I applaud that. I'm glad for you. Well, then, don't ask me to leave her alone anymore. I'm a catch, Mr. Maitland, a real catch. Not 
for Leah. Well, we'll just see about that, won't we? Sal, I don't want to play on your pity, but the truth is, I'm going to die soon, and when that happens, Leah will have no one. Now don't you worry, Mr. Maitland. She'll have someone to take care of her from now on. You've got my word on it. Not you. It mustn't be you. Yes, as a matter of fact, it must be me. I don't know what made you so superior. I just don't get it. What have you ever done that's so great? Teaching in that rat trap school all your life? No, not even teaching, just babysitting. I think I've heard enough. Even in the war, what did you get? A gimpy leg and a few souvenirs. A couple of crummy guns to hang on the wall. Old, same as you. You're a loser, you know that. Even worse than I used to be. I suppose you want Leah to marry someone just like you. I'll have to admit you're making some sense, Sal. Do you think you'd be a good husband to her? I can buy her anything if I want to. Anything. And do you love her? I want her, Mr. Maitland. Unfortunately, that isn't enough, Sal. She needs a man who can be... I picked up a few things for dinner on the way home. Daddy, how was your... Oh. Hello, Sal. Hello, Leah. Your father and I were just having a little chat. Were you? I should have gotten to know him better before. But back then, I couldn't have talked to him on this level. I can now, can't I, Mr. Maitland? I've spent a lot of time improving myself. You're certainly looking prosperous. Oh, you know how it is. I hit some luck, that's all. You even sound different. You noticed that. Well, I met this young fellow who was going to college. He needed some extra money, so we made a, a deal. He helped me out on the side, gave me lessons to uh, improve the way I talk. You must have worked very hard at it. Oh, yeah. I've discovered some talents I never knew I had. Seems like I learned quickly. Very quickly. Just what is your new job? I can tell you all about it over dinner. Dinner? Any place you like. Oh, that's something else I've learned. Where to go and how to act. I, uh... I don't think I'd better this evening. I told my father I'd... But now that I've improved myself so much, not even your father has a reason to object. Do you, Mr. Maitland? You're a grown woman, Leah. I've never tried to tell you what to do. You know that. Well, I would like to hear all about what's happened. If you're sure... As you wish. Just give me a minute, Sal. Take your time. Don't worry, Mr. Maitland. I'll have your daughter home early. I promise. Let's take our champagne onto the balcony, shall we? I'll open the French windows. If you like, Sal. Like the view? It's lovely. Your entire place is lovely. But, Sal... <laughs> Don't worry. Every dime is not only legal, but honest. A businessman's well-earned reward. What sort of business? Uh-uh. You're not getting all my secrets. Maybe someday I'll explain it to you. After we're married. What? You do know I'm going to marry you. It's getting cold. You might say I did it all for you. Oh, I won't pretend I haven't enjoyed it along the way, but... I always had a goal. I wish you hadn't. Come here. Sal, please. Now tell me you feel nothing. That was never the problem. I have to go. Then what was the problem? Y you broke off because I wasn't right for you. What kind of guy is right for you, Leah? Just tell me. I'll be that guy. It doesn't work that way. Well, I've got a surprise for you. It does with me. I can buy anything I want, and I can be anything I want. I wish I could explain it to you. It's not something you can buy. No? You name it. Sal, I'm talking about the kind of person you are. The way you feel about things and people. I'm not criticizing you. It's just the way you are. What way? The man I marry will have to be a kind man. Gentle. He'll have to be... What word can I use? Compassionate. I couldn't love him otherwise. You mean a patsy? Like your father, always ready to get pushed around? I mean a man who cares about other people just because they're people. And since you brought it up, yes, 
I think my father's a compassionate man. So you see, it's not something you can buy. Not even if you had your own private mint. Don't be so sure. Oh, there you are, Leah. Sal? You didn't have to wait up for us, Mr. Mayland. Here she is, safe and sounder than when she left. Have a nice evening. You certainly look as though you did. I'm sorry, Daddy, but it is nice to think that someone worries about me. Don't flatter yourself, my dear. Actually, I wanted to talk to Sal. In that case, if you'll excuse me, Sal, I've got a big day tomorrow. Good night. I'm glad you came in, Sal. You're going to be even gladder, Mr. Maitland. I've given it some thought. I realize now that you're the way you are, and it's not my place to judge you. Look, I don't care anything about Please, it. Please, let me finish. I've also decided that I can't let you ruin her life by marrying her. You thought of a way to stop it? Not yet. But there must be one. I could try begging you, Sal. Mr. Maitland, I'm not interested in your begging or your silly little threats. I came here to talk business. I don't understand. I'm going to make you an offer. I want to buy something from you, and I'm prepared to give you $500,000 for it. What did you just say? Now just let that figure roll around in your mind for a minute. 500000 cash. That's enough to take care of you for the time you've got left. And to provide for Leah so that she can do whatever she wants. Now, you say you're worried about what will happen to her when you die. Okay, here's your chance to fix it up just the way you want it. What do I have that's worth that kind of money? Mind if I sit down? It's a little difficult to explain. Something the matter, Sal? Hmm? Uh, oh, no, no, not at all. You seem so quiet. I was just thinking. About what? You. Oh, Sal. It must have been hard for you, working, going to school, taking care of your father. Oh, I never really thought about it. Well, I have, since yesterday. I never understood you before, but I think I'm beginning to now. You're a wonderful person, Leah. You deserve the best from now on. And I'll do my best to see that you have it. Sal, honestly, what's gotten into you? I'm finally seeing things clearly. Is your father home? I, I want to tell him how I feel now so he won't be concerned. Don't worry about Daddy. He only wants what's good for me. But I'm a grown woman. Hold on. Let me get the door for you. I think I'm capable of getting out of a car. I'm sure you are. But I want to. Hello, Daddy. Did you have something to eat? I left a meal in the refrigerator. Yes, thank you. Hello there, Mr. Maitland. I was hoping you were here. I find that hard to believe. I wanted to talk to you. May I come in? Well, I ask my permission. You must be cold, Daddy. Here, let me straighten your blanket. No, let me. Why, thank you, Sal. Leah, would you excuse us for a few minutes? Well, all right. I'll just freshen up. Go ahead, Sal. Say your piece. If you don't mind, sir. Well, I do have something to say. Just that... I'm sorry. What? For all the worry and grief I've caused you. You were right about me. I wanted to marry Leah to prove something. She was a prize. A symbol. But that's all changed, Mr. Maitland. I realize now how much I love her. And I will make her a good husband. I promise you. I warned you I would not let it happen. Please, Mr. Maitland, hear me out. It's different now. I've changed. Have you? I'm asking you for forgiveness, Mr. Maitland. Compassion. Oh, yes. A sterling human quality. Sir, your blanket. Let me fix it. Wait. What's in your hand? Isn't that one of your, your war souvenirs? I hope it's not loaded. Be careful. Compassion. But don't you remember, Sal? I don't have any left. I sold it to you. Yesterday. No, please. Wait! <laughs>
The Salvador Ross Program for Self-Improvement. The all-in-one, surefire course that lets you lick the bully, learn the language, dance the tango, and anything else you want or think you want to do. Oh, and there's a money-back guarantee. But the offer is strictly limited to the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Self-Improvement of Salvador Ross, starring Luke Perry with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Jerry McNeely from a story by Henry Slesser. Heard in the cast were Alyssa Fraden, David Darlow, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, Joseph Minoso, Ivan Vega, Tim Rose, Meg Falcon, and Mike Castle. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Well, Mr. Jensen, I think I have the basics here. Oh, yeah? 41 years old, unmarried, no physical ailments, no previous visits to a psychiatrist. No previous arrest either, okay? And the only time I ever saw a shrink before was in a cartoon. Best you'll find us helpful and, at worst, harmless. Cigarette? No, thanks. Do you mind if I smoke? Hey, go ahead. It's your office. Now then, uh, your occupation? Oh, gosh, various jobs. Part-time bookie, I was a car dealer. I attended bar one time, right down the street from here. A couple of doors down. Andy's place. I was a butcher. Highly successful butcher, too. Knew how to make my thumbs weigh 12 pounds on the scale. So what do you say, Doc? How do I stack up? Normal? Abnormal? Subnormal? What's the story? <laughs> Family? Father, mother, both married. Scranton, Pennsylvania. My old man was a coal miner. Coal? Yeah, you know, little black things that people used to put in the furnaces. Sounds like interesting work. Oh, it does. Then maybe you ought to go to a psychiatrist. You know, I think I will take one of those cigarettes. Surely. <sighs> what, do you want me to pull up a couch now or something? Not if you're comfortable in the chair. Let's begin, shall we? <laughs> Nothing shakes you up at all, does it, Doc? How do you mean? Oh, I don't know. Everything's all calm and cool. You know, when I walked in here, you made an inventory. The cut of the clothes, the way I talk, and up inside your head, huh? That's where you mark down those results. And then later you put it all in little pigeonholes. You got me pegged, don't you? Not entirely. You figure you're talking to what? Maybe a minor league horse player, huh? 
Maybe I'm a little hungover, maybe a little buggy in the head. But either way, about 40 degrees tilt. Hey, my cigarette went out. Here. <sighs> All right. Picture all this, Dr. Gillespie. If said minor league horse player tells you some half-witted story, can you tell him if he's maybe off his rocker? Without Sigmund Freud and all that junk? Huh? Can you tell me in plain English what is wrong with me? I can try. All right. Here goes. I keep having a dream. A crazy dream. Are you writing this stuff down? Go on. I'll make notes on the things that seem pertinent. Well, I don't know if any of this is pertinent. Because it probably sounds nuts. Sounds nuts to me. But there it is. I'm listening. I've had this dream maybe, uh, I don't know, five, six times. What kind of dream? The real kind. How do you mean? Have you ever had a dream that you swear was real? I guess we all have. Over and over again? The same dream? The same dream, identical. Never changes. Tell me about it. It always begins the same way. I'm lying in a bed, and I just wake up all of a sudden, right? I open my eyes, start looking around. And what do you see? Hotel room. You know, nothing fancy. I mean, nice, regular. You know, like Venetian blinds, like, like you got here. So I get up, I go across the room with my bare feet, all right? Now I'm wearing pajamas that definitely are not mine. And I open up the blinds. Bright sun, blue sky, beautiful day. Beach, palm trees, like a vacation, you know? So I open up the window. You get those, uh, what, those French doors, whatever you call them. And what do I hear? Steel guitars, ukuleles, you know, that, that, that hula music. The only thing is I've never been to Hawaii in my life. I don't even know what Hawaii looks like, except, you know, what you see in the movies. But it's as real as anything. And here's the crazy part. I, I don't know how I got there. But I do know, as well as I know anything in my life, that I'm supposed to be thousands of miles away. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing, Doc, that I could do about it. And that's when things get really weird. I mean, just bizarre. Once upon a time, there was a psychiatrist named Arnold Gillespie and a patient whose name was Peter Jensen. Mr. Jensen walked into the office exactly nine minutes ago. You might want to make note of that. It is 11 o'clock, Saturday morning, October 5th. You might want to make note of that, too, very specifically. It may seem trite to be so specific about the hour and the day, but in this case, it's of extreme importance. Because this isn't just a story about a man with a recurrent dream, one whose meaning the good doctor is about to help him unravel and sort out. Nothing so simple. Involved in this story is something new, not found in any textbook, Freudian or otherwise. Something we'll call, for want of a better term, the time element. <laughs> And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Time Element, starring Bobby Slayton with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Front desk. Hey, uh, uh, tell me something. So, uh, I got in, I got, uh, got in pretty late last night, didn't I? I beg your pardon, sir? I asked you if I got in late last night. Is this 206? I don't know. Is it 206? I really don't know, Mr. Jensen. I wasn't on duty last night. Yeah, how about a morning paper? Oh, should be one in the hall, outside your door. Yeah, thanks. That's perfectly all. What do you call this place, anyway? Sir? Well, was that such a hard question? I just asked you the name of the hotel. Do you work here, pal? Or are you just inspecting the kitchen or something? Why, this is the Royal Hawaiian. <laughs> uh, are you sure you're in the right hotel, Mr. Jensen? That's a good question. Here's the paper. December 6th. December 6th? What, what, what kind of crazy... Maid service. Did you sleep well, sir? Yeah, that's a moot question. Do you want me to clean the room now? Hey, do you want to explain the gag to me now? Uh, excuse me, sir? Do me a favor. Deliver a little message for me. You tell the guy, whoever put you up to this, that I'm going to knock out his teeth one by one. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, and take the phony newspaper with you, all right, lady? This is October. October, sir? What's October? What's October? 30 days, how's October, April, June, November, huh? Am I getting through to you? This month, this month right now, it's October, right? I don't believe so, sir. It's December. It's what? December the 6th. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. December 6th. Are you all right, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just fine. I'm fine. Except that obviously I've just come down the home stretch of the biggest toot in the history of man. 
You're telling me this is December. Well, last night, I was in New York City. And it was October. If you're not feeling well, I, I can come back later. Not feeling well? <laughs> you know what? That's the champion blue ribbon understatement of the year. You know, a little toot that lasts two months that ends up in, uh... Oh, what's the name of this place? The name of what place, sir? This place. This place right here. The Royal Hawaiian. That's what I mean. Since when is there a Royal Hawaiian Hotel in New York? It isn't in New York, sir. It's in Honolulu. Well, that figures, because the Royal Hawaiian is in Honolulu. Of course! See, that leads me to the next question. What am I doing in Hawaii? I'm sure I, I don't know, sir. <sighs> That's what I thought you said. Hey, hey just one more question. No, no, come here, come here. No, I, I'm okay, come here. Really? I'm not be asking anything else, I promise. What, sir? This hotel got a bar. Oh, yes, sir. A lovely one. And where is this lovely bar? Downstairs, off the lobby. Thank you. You're a doll. I'm sorry if I upset you. Look, if I ever had another mother, I, I really, I hope it's you, okay? Come back later. We'll, we'll, we'll dance. Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. How you doing, pal? Hello, sir. Bar's pretty crowded. I can show you to a booth if you like. Uh, there's one by the window. No, no, I, I want to sit at the bar. There are no seats left at the bar, sir. Look, let me ask you something. The President of the United States comes in here, wants a seat at the bar. You'd have one for him, wouldn't you? I suppose so, sir. Sure you would. Why? Because he's your Commander-in-Chief. But I guarantee you he's not going to be here today. So you know what? How about if I take his stool? Well, not my Commander, but still. Not yours? What does that mean? This is the United States of America, right? No, sir. It's Hawaii. Yeah, that's what I just said. Hawaii. Are you a state or aren't you? A state? <laughs> Hardly. That's one thing that will never happen. Is that right? Well, you know what? Why don't you take a look at the history books? Because for your information, buddy, Hawaii became a state in 1959. What do you think of that? <laughs> 1959? Well, that's very funny. Yeah, well, you're not funny, all right? Bloody Mary, please. Uh, that stool's occupied. Yeah, by who? The Invisible Man? Guy just stepped out. Then you know what? I'll keep it warm for the guy. Uh, give the gentleman a drink. Yeah, I want the tomato juice really anemic with lots of vodka, huh? Maybe five fingers, huh? You're the boss. Sure, baby. We'll take a walk on the beach. Hmm. Then we can have lunch in the room. Sounds swell. Ah, that's better. Keep him coming, my boy. I'm on the last lap of the biggest binge in the world. Ha <laughs> ha. Rough night? Rough night? Why don't you try 30 of them? Would you believe it? I passed out in New York a month ago. And this morning, I wake up here. I know the feeling. One time, I fell asleep at the Dublin airport. And, and when I woke up, I was on a British troop train going into Palestine. That really happened. Can you believe that? Good man. <clears throat> Hi, you two. Hi. I'd like you to meet my wife. Chop. I'd like you to meet my drink. Uh, how do you do? You kids look like you're in love. How long have you been married? One day, six hours, and twelve minutes. No kidding. <laughs> Never would have guessed it. Hey, bartender, you're from New York, aren't you? Born, bred, and raised. How'd you know? Because you got a picture of the great Fiorello LaGuardia. It's the best mayor New York City ever had. Yeah, he sure is. Was. How's that? He was a good mayor. That's what I said. No, 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 no. You said he is. Well, isn't he? He was. Because he's not here now, is he? No, I, I guess he isn't. He's in New York, where he should be. Yeah, because he's dead. I sure hope not. When did you hear that? Anybody ever tell you you got a wacky, nutsy sense of humor? What are you, the argumentative type? No, not me. I just want to tell you that if you're trying to rip me, I'm going to come back there behind the bar for about seven minutes, and you're going to be fixing all those Bloody Marys with a fresh supply of blood from a broken nose, all right? Hey, take it easy, mister. Let me buy you a drink. No, no, no. Let me buy you one, okay? Come on, around for the newlyweds. You know they're drinking champagne. Hey, what do I look like here? Deadbeat? Come on, give him champagne. Two more. To the bride and groom. Long may she wave. Hey, bartender. Over here. What'll it be? So what do you want for ship? You bet your life. Best one afloat. The Arizona. The what? The Arizona. Well, when did they dredge her out of the mud? Say... Don't get mad, honey. He didn't mean anything. Talking about my battle wagon, and she's never been close to the mud. Oh, she hasn't, really. Hey, buddy boy, let me tell you something. Got a lovely wife, but a lousy memory. And now, are you trying to tell me the Arizona was never sunk? I'm not trying to tell you. I'm telling you. The Arizona's never been sunk in her life. Never, huh? You know it. You know it, I don't, okay? 
I say she got sunk on December 7th, 1941, okay? And that's where she sits today, in the mud at Pearl Harbor, okay? Now, what do you think of that? What'd you say? I said... I have returned. I feel like a new man. And now that new man needs a drink, too. <clears throat> oh, here's your newspaper, Bond Hunter. Another one of your liquid libations for me, please? Get off that stool! He was here before. Let me see that paper. Take it with you on your way out. Let me see this. Jeff Envoys to FDR. Hey, wait, what kind of paper is this, huh? What are you guys doing? Where'd you get this? The Honolulu Advertiser, Saturday, December 6th, 1941. You owe me for the champagne and uh, one Bloody Mary. But it isn't 1941. Do you hear me? Ask anybody. How about you, you? How about you? Somebody speak up. What is the matter with you people? I have to ask you to leave now, buddy. Oh, what? Because you think it's 1941? Because everybody in here is in on this stupid joke? It's not 1941. It can't be 1941. I mean, how, how could it be? So how can it be 1941, Doc? Can you tell me that? Huh? And the dream ends there? No. It just goes on. I see. But up to that point, each dream is identical, you say? Identical. I even remember going to the door of the bar and looking out in the street. And I, I, I see all the cars. 1939, 40, 41 models. Nothing newer. Go on. All right, all right. I get this. <laughs> and this is what separates the men from the wacky. I don't think it's a dream, Doc. It's not a dream. Make all the little chicken tracks you want on that little piece of paper. What I'm telling you here is the goods. I believe you. You do? Then why don't you call up the sanitarium and tell them we'll take a double room? Because you're nuts also. I mean, I understand why you think it's real. Some dreams are extremely realistic. As often as not, they're impossible to distinguish from reality. No, you don't get what I'm saying. Look, it isn't just that it's real while I'm asleep, Doc. Well, I'm telling you this, it's still real. It's still real even when I'm awake. All of it. Look, I've had dreams like everybody else, but as soon as it started, I knew it was different. I, I, do you understand me? Do you understand me? You don't understand me. These are not dreams. If they're not dreams, Mr. Jensen, what are they? What do you think they are? Let's examine the alternatives. I can think of only one. That's the one I'm thinking of, okay? I wake up in a hotel room in 1941. But I mean, I really wake up. I really wake up, and it's really 1941. Do you understand? Going back in time. That's what I'm doing, Doc. I'm going back in time. Huh. Interesting. What happens then when you're back in time? <laughs> you sure you want to hear this? I do. Then hold on to your hat, Doc, because from this point on, things go completely screwy. Hello? Want to place a bet? Well, are you a bookie or not? All right, then. I'm going to take Joe Lewis over Buddy Bear. What are the odds on Lewis? Well, they will be scheduled, okay? They're going to fight on January 9th. Yeah, January 9th, okay? Make it Lewis in the first round. Now, what's the line? 30 to 1. Ha <laughs> it's more like it. What do you mean, how do I know? Just trust me, I know. I know, that's all. The name's Jensen. I'm with the Royal Hawaiian. Now, how about the All-Star game for next year? Hey, do you want to cover me or not, huh? Okay, I'll take the American League. Let me ask you something. What kind of odds if I predict the score? Oh, you got I spend the next two and a half hours making bets on sure things, right? Every race, every prize fight, every football game I can remember happening after December of 1941. See, I got to figure that if this goes on, I'm a shoo-in to put every bookie in town out of business. Now, I'm not scared, you understand. See, I don't have one idea what I'm doing back here, but as long as I am here, I figure, hey, why not put it to good use? You know what I'm saying? Jensen. That's right. Royal Hawaiian. Oh, hey, 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 how are you, buddy? You're the ensign from, from the bar. I hope you don't mind. No, no, come in, come in. Uh, I just wondered, uh, how you doing? I'm fine. Come on in. Have a drink. My wife, uh, my wife asked me to stop by and see how you felt. Yeah, it was very nice of her. I feel great. I'm fine. Hey, what are you drinking? Uh, no thanks. We're going swimming. She was a little concerned. My wife, I mean. About what? About me? Well, it's just that 
down at the bar after you saw the paper and... No, 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 don't worry about it. I was, I was going to ring you up and apologize. That whole Arizona bit. Sure. Are you, uh, sick or something? No, 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 I'm not sick. Well, what made you say it wasn't 1941? No, nothing. I was a little whirly in the head, that's all. Sure. Well, we'll be back about four or five. Uh, maybe you'd like to have a drink with us then, if you feel okay. You got yourself a deal. Hey, one more thing. Yeah? So what do, you, what do you do on the Arizona? I'm in the engineering section. You work down below? Yeah, most of the time. Good job? I like it. Well, we'll give you a call. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. How is he? I think he's okay. Uh, said to give him a call when we get back. Oh, that's great. So I remember thinking, right at that moment, these two kids were so much in love, you could take the looks they gave each other, you could spread it on pancakes. And while I'm watching them, it hits me. This boy looks down in the hold of a ship that has about 14 hours left to ride the waves. After that, it goes down under with a thousand men. And suddenly, making bets on things that I know will happen seems about as interesting as catching lake trout in a milk bottle. You know what I'm saying? Somehow trying to help those two kids is the one thing in the whole wide world that matters. So I do the only thing I can do. I make a fool out of myself. Hey, front desk. Hey, I need directions to get to the Schofield Barracks. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, U.S. Army Base. Come in. Excuse me, Colonel, but... Spit it out, Bailey. That guy is still in the orderly room, sir. Says he wants to see somebody in charge. Who's this now? Some jerk with a tambourine or something. Must be Save a Soul Saturday. What's his story? I can't piece it all together, sir. Something about the Japanese having bombs? <sighs> this ought to be good. Send him in. Yes, sir. Uh, the Colonel will see you now. You're Mr... Jensen, Pete Jensen. I'm Colonel Abernathy. What's on your mind, Mr. Jensen? First of all, Colonel, I want to guarantee that I'm not going to get stuck in a rubber room when I'm finished telling you this. You've got it. I have information that the Japanese are bombing Pearl Harbor tomorrow morning. 8 a.m., Honolulu time. You know this to be a fact. Colonel, as sure as I know, the good Lord made racehorses. They're coming over here in about 30 waves off a bunch of carriers. They're going to plaster us while we're still in bed. Oahu, the airfield, right here too. Schofield Barracks. Hmm. This is very serious. I better take immediate steps. Bailey? Sir? Have Captain Franklin contact the naval station at Pearl. Uh, yes, sir. See that they have all personnel standing by. At least 30 PBYs ready to go up. Tell Lieutenant Ordway to call the commanding general. All troops on the beach. <laughs> if you say so, sir. <laughs> All right, come on, knock it off. Cut the game. <laughs> listen to me, you brass-covered hyena, okay? Don't you say that nobody warned you. I warn you. You gotta listen to me. I'm sure you're right. Now you can leave peacefully, Mr. Jensen, or I'll have you escorted outside. Go walk by myself, okay? And if anybody grabs me, you're gonna have to call the medical corps on the double. We don't appreciate that kind of talk. Is that a fact? And what do you appreciate, Colonel, huh? Maybe you'd appreciate a big punch in the jaw. All the trouble I take for getting over to try to save you people. This is what I get? All right, Jensen, zip it. You walk on that lower lip one more time, soldier boy, and I'll get you out of the army in a medical. You understand me? Believe me, Mr. Jensen, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. Oh, I believe it. Colonel! Oh! No! Are you all right? Place this man under arrest and fit him for a straitjacket. Yes, sir. Then what happened? Well, finally they let me leave, right? After I answered some questions about what year it was, and did I know who the president was? I had some trouble with the vice president. Uh, you know, Truman, of course, sure. But, you know, Roosevelt dies, Truman takes over, then it's Eisenhower. Good thing I didn't mention Ike. <laughs> in 41, he was still a white colonel on the general staff in Washington. <laughs> Think of it. They never heard of rock and roll, jet planes, TV, atom bombs. <sighs> anyway, they decided I was harmless. So on the way out, I gave him a V-sign and told him to buy some more buns. And after that? What am I going to do? I had my shot. So I figure I'm just going to spend the rest of the day drinking quietly. Of course, the next morning they come looking for me to give me a bronze statue, but... But then it's going to be too late, you know? I didn't care anymore. What am I supposed to do? But I'll tell you something. There was some feeling to watch those kids relaxing in the bar with their dates and their drinks. Like, Everything was fine, like they had a future, and all was well with the world, you know? Where tomorrow there'd be a couple of thousand of them on their way through hell to get to heaven.
Oh, yeah. Likewise. Hey, uh, you know what you were talking about this morning? I got a vague recollection. Yeah, about the Arizona being sunk. Knock it off. You don't believe me? Well, you don't see me bleeding, do you? I'm not trying to drum up an argument. I just wanted to show you something. Take a look out the window. You see that ship in the harbor? That happens to be the Arizona. So I guess somebody got their signals crossed. She's still afloat. <laughs> Come on, I said knock it off. Mr. Jensen? Yeah, hi. Have that drink with us? Yeah, yeah, sure, thanks. Yeah, yeah. How was the swim? It was wonderful. So how long's it been now? 32 hours and 15 minutes. Oh, uh, they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> Mr. Jensen? Try Pete. Pete. Well, are you all right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm all right. Why? It's just that this morning, you seemed so sure it was another year. I did? Hey, look, honey, you know I'm kind of mixed up here. You, I, I, look, I didn't mean anything personal, all right? I told you to forget it. <sighs> oh, boy, look at you two. What's the matter? I lied just now. I wasn't kidding. The Arizona is going to be sunk. Are we on that again? Yeah, we're on that again. Listen to me, Lieutenant. Anson. Look, whatever. I got no axe to grind, you understand? Tomorrow morning, I'm going down to the basement so I can cuddle up to a furnace and listen to the sirens. You said you're an engineering officer. That means you're down near the boilers. I'm telling you, at about 20 minutes past 8 in the morning, there's not going to be any boilers. Do you understand? There's not going to be any decks, and there won't be any ship left. That goes for a lot of boilers, and a lot of ships, and a lot of decks. Not to mention handsome young ensigns with new brides. Please, don't talk like that. I gotta talk like that. December 7th, 1941 is tomorrow for you, but it's history for me. Do you understand? Last night, I was in New York City, and it was years from now. I've lived through those years. I know what's gonna happen. I know it sounds crazy, but I know what's gonna happen. Hey, you. No more trouble, huh? Hey, you shut your mouth. Nobody's talking to you. Hey, look, look, look. You're nice young kids. I, I got no reason in the world to give you any grief. Okay, just do me a favor and listen. Take a hundred to one shot that this weirdo in front of you maybe has a point, okay? I'm telling you that tomorrow morning we're gonna get attacked. And if you're on that ship... I'll be on that ship because that's my birth. You're a nice fellow and all, Mr. Jensen, but if you keep saying wild things and making my wife upset, I'm... Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Sit around holding hands and biting earlobes till he goes back to his ship? Because if this boy goes back to that Arizona, he might not be alive at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Repeat, he may not be alive. Please. <laughs> Mr. Jensen, I'm warning you. Hey, buddy, I don't want no trouble. You don't want no trouble, huh? He doesn't want any trouble. Hey, I don't want to give you any trouble. I want to give you music, okay? I want to sing a song for you. Praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord, pass the ammunition. And we'll all stay free. Huh? You hear that? <laughs> it's what you're all going to be singing. Want another one? Oh, oh, how does it go? Uh, let's remember Pearl Harbor. Come on, come on, you write the words. Come on, come on. All right, buddy, that's it. Shut up. <laughs> Tell me the general can't be reached. I know he can be reached. He may not be alive to call me tomorrow. Yeah, this is... Hello? 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 Yes, I want to call Navy 7096. 7096. Yes, that's right. Hello, is this a naval station? Yeah, let me talk to whoever's in charge. Yeah, hello? Listen, I have some information here. The Japanese are going to attack Pearl Harbor, right? Hello? I said the Japanese are... Hello? Hello? What are we going to do? It's almost too late. What time is it? 8 o'clock. It's 8 o'clock in the a.m. 8 o'clock. That means it's December 7th. It's December 7th already. What are we going to do? Why would anybody listen to me? Why? I told you they were coming. I told you. I told you they were coming. I told you. I told all of you. I told you. I told them, Doc. I told them. I told them over and over. Why wouldn't anybody listen to me? And then? I'm standing there by the French windows, and I'm watching the planes coming low. I'm watching them. The bombs are dropping, strafing. All hell is breaking loose. And that's, that's where I wake up, every time. Realistic and very frightening. How long did you say it's been going on? Every night for a week. And always the same. Everything. The ensign and his girl, the bar, me trying to call from my room. And the moment, the moment I see the planes coming in. Mr. Jensen, I won't attempt to analyze that dream, except to say this. 
Very often we dream with a purpose. It can signify something deeply rooted in the subconscious. The things you dream about may not be what's really bothering you. Well, don't try to outlogic me, Doc, okay? You think I'm nuts, don't you? I know what I know. I can't explain it. But that's why I came to see you, because I thought maybe you could explain it. I know for a fact I'm going back in time. And I'll tell you something else, that even after I wake up and I'm laying in bed and I'm thinking about the dream, I know it's not supposed to end there. I know one of these nights it's going to go beyond that. But you have no idea what might transpire. No, not one. All right. Let's approach it this way. Assume that it is possible somehow to go back in time. You go back and you do something, uh, warn people, say, about an accident so that it doesn't happen. But what have you done then, Mr. Jensen? By altering the past, you change the future. Here, look. This is the present, and my lighter is on my desk. Now I go back in time and I pick up this lighter. I put it in my pocket and I keep it there. Then I return to the present. By any rights, having removed that lighter, it should no longer be here. But if it is, you get my point? Look, Doc. You try this analogy, Mr. Jensen. Supposing I were to go back in time and I got hit, say, by a taxi. Now it figures that if I went back in time and got killed, I couldn't be alive today. Not only that, but think of the other lives affected. I wouldn't have children, I wouldn't have bought a house, uh, all these things wouldn't exist because I changed them. Ergo, I wouldn't be here to go back. So? So time travel is not possible. It can't be. It creates an insoluble paradox. Therefore, we can safely assume that what we're talking about is a dream. It has to be. Try this thing. I've never been to Honolulu in my whole life. So after the first couple of times, I decided, I decided to put it to a test. Go on. I remembered the ensign's last name. It's kind of an odd name, not easy to forget. Janowski. Told me it came from a little town called White Oak, Wisconsin. So I placed a call. There was only one Janowski in the phone book. Woman answered. His mother. I said it was a friend of his from Honolulu. How was he then? And then? She told me that her son and his wife were killed in Honolulu on December 7th, 1941. He went down with the Arizona. She was shot down near King Street by a fighter plane, a Japanese zero. A Japanese zero, Doc. You sure you've never been to Honolulu? Yeah, I've been there. When? In the dream, which isn't a dream. Okay, Doc. Your turn. I don't hear you talking. That's because... At the moment, I don't know what to say. The patient lay on the couch. We had been talking for hours. It was Saturday and I would planned to leave early and go play golf. But I was concerned about this man and his story. It was incredible. Then finally, I knew he was asleep. It wasn't a deep sleep. By the look on his face, Mr. Jensen was far from resting, though his eyes were closed. Mr. Jensen? Are you asleep, Mr. Jensen? So I decided to let him rest while I thought it through. Who knows, maybe he'd even finish his dream this time. How's your eye, Mr. Jensen? I mean, Pete. Hey, don't worry about me. I'm fine. I'll put a piece of steak on it. Sorry the bartender hit you. I should have stopped him, but I kind of got carried away, too. No, no harm done. Well, go lie down and take it easy. Uh, maybe we'll see you later before I go back to the ship. Hey, Janowski, do me one favor, will you? Play hooky tomorrow morning. He's out of his head. Look, if you never do one thing for the rest of your life, do this, will you? Come on. Stay off that ship. Take the little lady. Get away from Pearl Harbor. Come on. I don't care where you go. Get on a Pan Am and go to the Canal Zone, anywhere, but just get out of here. That's a great plan. And you know what it would cost me? Only my commission in the Navy, that's all. Jimmy, forget it. If you don't go, do you know what that's going to cost you? Just a little item like your life, and hers too. I tried to be nice, but this time I swear I... Come on, Jimmy. Let's go to our floor. Please, come on. What do you got to lose? I'm going to try to save your lives, that's all. Poor, dumb, crazy kids. Oh, you tell me the general can't be reached. I know he can be reached. He might not be alive tomorrow to call me. Please, hello? Hello? Yes, I want to call Navy 7096. That's right. Hello? Is this a naval station? Let me talk to whoever's in charge. This is 
is Ensign Lamers. It's my watch and it's your nickel, so go ahead. What's on your mind? Listen to me. The Japanese are going to attack Pearl Harbor. Who? What are they going to do? I said the Japanese... What have you been drinking? I'll tell you what. Take a nice shower and dive into a percolator. Good night. Hello? Hello? It's almost too late. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? <sighs> Again. What time is it? 8 o'clock in the a.m. Already 8... Oh, that means it's December 7th. Why? Me? Why wouldn't anybody listen to me? Why? I told you they were coming. I told you! I told you. I stood there at the window for a long time, thinking about Mr. Jensen and his problem, his dream. I knew I had to wake him and send him on his way, at least for now. I could give him some sleeping pills, uh, maybe a program of therapy, till I could talk to some doctors that I knew and ask if they had ever had a case like this one. Mr. Jensen? Mr. Jensen? It's getting late. I, I... I'm afraid I'm going to have to... Mr. Jensen? Mr. Jensen, where did you... Carol? Yes, Dr. Gillespie? What happened to the patient? The patient? Jensen. I didn't realize he'd slipped out. I let him fall asleep on the couch because he looked so exhausted. I don't know anything about him, Mr. Jensen, doctor. The man who was in my office all afternoon. It's a good thing there were no other appointments. I hope you have his number. I wanted to schedule a series of sessions starting next week. I'm really sorry, sir, but I... I don't show any appointments at all today. I was wondering how long you needed me. I have a date this evening, and... Hold on. You mean to tell me a man named Jensen didn't walk in here and ask to see me? Big guy, uh, shirt with flowers on it? Why, no, sir. I've been here the whole time. I thought you wanted me to stay and work on the files. Uh, all right, Carol, that will be all. You can go now. I'll lock up. Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Try this analogy, Mr. Jensen. Supposing I were to go back in time and I got hit, say, by a taxi. Now it figures that if I went back in time and got killed, I couldn't be alive today. today, today. Alive today. Alive today. today. Alive today. Alive, 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 alive. Welcome to Andy's place. Where can I get you? Bourbon on the rocks, please. One bourbon coming up. Here you go. Need a light? No, thanks. I've got it. A lighter. Yes, I do. Right here. In my pocket. Cheers. Happy dreams. Same to you. What in the... Problem, mister? No, it was just that picture there. The one in the frame on the wall? Ah, uh, yeah. A group of men in uniform. All except one in a flowered shirt. It looks familiar. Pete Jensen. He used to attend bar here a long time ago. You heard of him? Jensen? Uh, no. I don't remember that name. He looked familiar, that's all. Where's he now? Him? He's dead. He got killed before I was born at Pearl Harbor. More down here? Sure. Do more of the same. Once upon a time, there was a psychiatrist named Arnold Gillespie and a patient whose name was Peter Jensen. You might want to make note of both names for the record should you ever run across either one in a textbook. It is now Saturday, October 5th, at exactly 5.10 p.m. You might want to make note of that, too, if you're even remotely interested in a new theory about something we'll call, for want of a better term, the time element, at least as it is measured in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. 
Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop, twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. The Time Element, starring Bobby Slayton, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Maggie Carney, Craig Brawley, Elizabeth Lado, Jeff Lupiton, Doug James, Kurt Navig, Sarah Marks, Roger Walski, Bo Nortel, and Carl Amari. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcheson, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. My name is Archibald Beechcraft, and to coin a phrase, welcome to my world. And a wonderful world it is. You might even call it paradise. To tell you the truth, I don't remember exactly how I got here, but I assure you I have no intentions of leaving. No intentions whatsoever. Why should I? Everything I need is here. The sand, the sea, the sky, as blue as a robin's egg, gently swaying palms, and absolutely nothing on the horizon. Nothing. And no one. Do you understand? Not a soul in sight as far as the eye can see. Only the occasional bottle that washes up on the beach. Like this one. Ah, <sighs> They're all the same. With a note inside, some poor soul scribbling a message for help. Whoever reads this, I am stranded on a desert island. Please send a rescue ship at once. <laughs> stranded? A rescue ship? The fool! Doesn't he know he's finally found peace? He's escaped from the crowds, the rat race, from civilization. Obviously an imbecile. Who would want to go back to that world? Cars, subways, buses, and people. Everywhere you look, yammering away, pushing and shoving till you can't breathe, can't think. No thanks. I've had my fill of people. If you don't mind, I'll live out my days like this. Alone. Quite blissfully alone. Except, of course, for Chi-Chi, the perfect companion. Never a word of disagreement. In fact, never a word of any kind. Because, you see, he's a chimpanzee. And a very intelligent one. If I'm hungry, he brings me a banana. When I'm thirsty, he climbs a tree and picks a ripe coconut. Have you ever tasted fresh coconut milk? Oh, you must. It's really quite refreshing. Hold on, Chi-Chi. What's this? A footprint? Well, that means... We're not alone, after all. But how can that be? This is my world! Wait a minute. Whoever made this footprint, do you suppose his name might be... Friday? If so, he'll speak an entirely different language. No communication whatsoever, and plenty of room for both of us. He'll have his half of the island, and I'll have mine. Unless, of course, Friday's a female. 
You think it's possible? Why, I don't see why not. A lovely native girl in a sarong with big brown eyes like a Walter Keene painting. And a tray of finger sandwiches, poi, that sort of thing. Maybe some Mai Tais. Who can't speak, of course. No, no, why should she? She'll live in her grass hut and I'll live in mine and we'll visit from time to time. An ideal arrangement, I'll give her a lay, a flower lay, whenever the spirit moves me. And when the spirit doesn't move me... Now where's that coming from? There aren't any telephones on my island. It can't be a telephone booth on the beach. Most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Yes? Yes, who is it? Who in the... Hello, who's there? Hello? Who? H Hello? Tropical Paradise, Beechcraft speaking. Hello? Hello? Oh, oh, the alarm clock. I must have been dreaming again. What time is it? Half past six already? This is my world, all right. And welcome to it. A brief, if somewhat jarring, introduction to Mr. Archibald Beechcraft. A child of his time, a product of the population explosion, and an unwilling inheritor of the legacy of progress. He has just begun his daily battle for survival in a world that cares not one whit for his happiness or sanity. But very soon, our hero will begin a one-man rebellion against this impersonal age. And to do so, he will enlist the help of certain unusual aids of the sort found only in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Mind and the Matter, starring Hal Sparks with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Morning, Beechcraft. I don't see what's so good about it. How's that? If you'll excuse me, I'm late. <laughs> You're always late. Take it easy. You'll get there. I'm sure I will. And what an unmitigated joy that will be. Ninety-one. Ninety-two. Ninety-three. Stand aside. I don't have to. My mom said I could play. And I said move it. Ninety-four. Ninety-five. Ninety-six. Why do you have to do that here, inside the building? Oh, you made me lose count. Now I have to start all over again. One, two, three, four. Get out of my way, you little wretch. Ma, that man called me a wretch. Hey, watch it, buddy. Sorry. Look where you're going. Beg your pardon. Hey, careful with the briefcase, huh? I, I'm late, you see. Hey, he almost knocked me down. If I miss my train... Red light, Mr. Red light. But I can't wait for the light to change. If I do miss my train, then, then they'll dock my pay, meager though it may be. And if they do that, well, there's no limit to what they can do. I'm not about to jeopardize my position just because of all the rude, inconsiderate people who are... are ruining this city. Positively ruining. That's my train! Slow down, one at a time. But you see, officer, I absolutely must catch the 732 uptown. Keep your shirt on, pal. Let me through, please. Watch who you're pushing. You don't understand. This is my... Hands off, buddy. One person per token. I don't have a token. Well, then you better get one at the window. But I overslept. I'm late. One at a time, folks. Let's keep moving. Let me on, please. Hey, you stepped on my foot. Move to the back, please. This elevator's full. But I absolutely must get to the 15th floor. Why don't you wait for the next one? I can't wait. I'm late as it is. I said this one's full. Surely there's room for one more. Sorry, Beechcraft. If I could just squeeze in. Will you watch the elbow? I do apologize. Going up. There's Mr. Beechcraft. Finally decided to make it, hmm? Better late than never. Morning, Laura. What happened to you? What didn't? If you'd been through what I've been through. Did you punch in? Yes. Mr. Rogers got here 15 minutes ago. I'm sure he did. I told him you went to get coffee. Coffee? 
That's what I need. Not now. And my blood pressure pills. Wait till the break. Look like you're busy. You mean pretend? I don't have to pretend. Of course, in a reasonable world where a person could work at his own pace, with no pressure, no interruptions... Mr. Rogers will be back any minute. I'll bet he will. <sighs> All right. When did I leave off yesterday? The Campbell file, as I recall. I'm finishing it for you. What? You shouldn't have done that. I'm quite capable. I know you are. I was only trying to help. Thank you, Laura. But if I could be allowed to concentrate without so many distractions, there'd be no problem. Here's your coffee, Miss Petty. Oh, thank you, Henry. You can call me Laura, you know. All right, Laura. I didn't know how you wanted it, so I got cream and sugar. Is that okay? That's fine. Kindly give it back. Hmm? The Campbell file. I'm just about to close it out. Where do you want me to set it? What? The coffee. Just a minute. If you please, Laura. Here you go. Oh, oh no. Why, you clumsy clod. Gosh, Mr. Beechcraft, I sure am sorry. You spilled it all over my jacket. I guess I didn't see you. That's precisely your problem. Try cold water before the stain sets. I'll get another cup. That's all right, Henry. No harm done. I ought to send you the cleaning bill. Is that Beechcraft? Yes, sir. Looks like he's headed for the washroom. Something the matter? Well, Mr. Rogers, you see, um... He's a little out of sorts this morning. Is he now? Feeling ill, Beechcraft? Hmm? Oh. No, sir. Nothing like that. If you'll forgive an observation, you're not looking too well. I'm all right, Mr. Rogers. You look tired. You know, Beechcraft, keeping yourself fit is not only a personal responsibility. In a larger sense, it's part of your obligation to the firm that employs you. Healthy body, healthy mind, and so forth. I'm not unaware of that. Then why don't you pull yourself together, man? Get enough sleep at night. I try to, sir. Eat regular meals. Lots of fresh vegetables, greens. Oh, you can't beat those greens for vitamins. I'm a sprouts and spinach man myself. Are you? I'd have them for breakfast if I could. Believe me, Beechcraft. The secret is definitely in the greens. It's the color of power. I see. Not drinking, are you, Beechcraft? Touch of the old sauce? I don't drink, Mr. Rogers. Well, if you don't drink and you don't stay out late at night, you must not be watching your diet. From now on, see that you do. If you'd really like to know, Mr. Rogers, if you'd really like to know precisely why I'm so dead tired, Try coming to work on the 732 subway train every morning, then jamming into an elevator with a herd of cattle, then trying to work in that... that den of cacophony you call an office. Take hold of yourself, Beechcraft. Then standing in line in that so-called cafeteria during that so-called lunch hour, which is never more than 42 minutes. Oh, that's really good for the digestion. Then getting trampled to death in the subway again at 5.38 every night. Then standing in line with more people at a greasy spoon restaurant followed by another line at a movie or a concert or anywhere else I care to go. But always standing in line, always getting shoved, always getting jostled, always getting pushed around by more People! For goodness sakes, man, take hold! I'll take hold, Mr. Rogers. I'll take hold when I can achieve that milestone. That millennium. That absolute perfection that only comes with solitude. Understand? Solitude. That means no people. You read me, Mr. Rogers? They're the ultimate insult. And my problem is simply that I can't get away from them. At no time, except during the wondrous seven and a half hours I spend in my bed every night. And even then, I hear them outside. Hear what? People! Raucous, shrieking, shouting people, herds, droves, legions, hosts, armies, bevies, flocks, and coveys of people, people, people. I don't like that look in your eye, Beechcraft. I don't like it one bit. If I had my way, here's how I'd fix the universe. I'd eliminate them all. I mean, cross them off. Get rid of them. Send them packing, destroy them, and then there'd be only one man left. Me. Archibald Beechcraft Esquire. Let me out of here. You're quite mad. Do you know that, Beechcraft? You're either off or en route away from your rocker. Well, if I am, I very much prefer my madness to, to the so-called sanity around me. People, as far as I'm concerned, you can have them. If I had my way, I'd make them all disappear. Every last one. 
Well, well, well. Old Beechcraft's finally showing some gumption. Just the same, I'd best keep a close eye on him. A very close eye indeed. Mm, I'll have a baked fish. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Salisbury steak for me. Coming right up. Oh, and an extra roll. Vegetables with that? And broccoli. Sure thing. No mashed potatoes, no french fries, no, I'll, uh, I'll have the succotash today. Club sandwich here. Dessert? How's the tapioca pudding? Lumpy. Uh, I need another fork. This one's dirty. You got it. One club sandwich, coleslaw, no fries, coffee black. There you go. That's it, sir. And that's right, the usual. So I see. Cash or charge? Cash. Get my wallet out of my pocket. There's hardly room to turn around. Don't you have anything smaller? No, I'm afraid not. Your change. Hurry up, will you, buddy? We don't have all day. I'm doing my best. If you'd allow me to put my wallet away. Next, one double macaroni and cheese, salad with ranch. Excuse me. The seat's saved. Well, how about the one next to it? No, he'll be right back. Of course. Of course he will. Hey, Mr. Beechcraft, over here. Thank God. I'm obliged, Henry. Think nothing of it, Mr. Beechcraft. Squeeze right in. That was my plan. Been saving it for you. I was sort of... Well, I wanted to make up for this morning. This morning? When I spilled coffee on your coat. I'm really sorry about that. Mm. Mm. Say, Mr. Beechcraft? Mm -hmm. I have a friend. Mm. You don't say. Works in the used bookstore around the corner. I went there before lunch. Whatever for? Oh, I like to read. All kinds of stuff. Do tell. Horror, mostly. That's my favorite. Why am I not surprised? Some of those paperbacks are pretty cool, you know? There was one about these giant worms that live in the sub-sub-basement of an office building, and if you took the elevator down there late at night, these big old white old worm things will be waiting for you. And they must have been really hungry, because, uh... Please, Henry. I'm eating. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I went over there today, and, uh, I saw this. So I, I sort of got it for you. What is it? Story of a serial killer who wants to depopulate the Earth? Uh, nothing like that. Take a look. I thought you might like it. The mind and the matter. How you can achieve the ultimate power of concentration. Think this is something I need, Henry? It's really rare. There are only a few printed. A little on the occult side, isn't it? Uh, maybe so. But seeing as how you always have so much work to do, my friend is kind of a student of the mind. He swears by this. Says it's the last copy. The publisher was supposed to destroy all of them. For what reason? Too powerful. It tells you how to make people do things. Thing? Would you believe it, Mr. Beechcraft? I've seen him. I've seen my friend cause a woman to do... To do something fantastic. How's that? It's true. He was in a department store, and he saw this woman at the sale table, and he concentrated real hard on one particular thing, and... Mr. Beechcraft, as sure as I'm sitting here in the cafeteria of the United Tool and Dye Company, that woman... You won't believe this. What? Well, that woman picked up a chartreuse and orange scarf, paid for it and everything. She never would have bought it in a million years. Who would? But he made her do it, just like that. It's the truth, I swear. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Will you please try to be more careful? Oops, there goes the coffee again. Sorry, Mr. Beechcraft. Thank you so much for the book, Henry. Now, if you don't mind, I think I'll be leaving. I've had more than my fill. Mr. Beechcraft, Chapter 3! Uh, read that one first! Remember, Chapter 3! Right, Henry. Chapter 3. Initial phenomenon of intense concentration. Focus on a single desired outcome. And close your eyes, mental picture, repeat three times. Ready to go back? Not yet. I have to fix my makeup. Okay. Wait, I think I'll have a soda first. Want one? Nah. Let me see. Orange, root beer, grape. Might as well give it a try. Concentrate. Tropical punch. Pick tropical punch. I just can't make up my mind. It's delicious. Try it. You'll like it. 
Why'd you pick that one? I don't know. I really don't. I was going to choose lemon lime, but for some reason my finger pressed tropical punch. How's it taste? Might as well find out. Yes! You'll see. It's absolutely delicious. Puts one in the mind of a Mai Tai. I think I'd better read the entire book. Chapter 4, To Achieve Your Heart's Desire. Heart's Desire, eh? Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. The most important element is concentration. Blot out the quotidian irrelevancies that pollute your day. Quotidian? Nice vocabulary. Mr. Beechcraft? The science of the mind requires absolute adherence to the following rules. Mr. Beechcraft? Uh, what is it, Laura? Did you turn in the Campbell file? Campbell? John R. From this morning. I don't see it. I'll get to it. Now, then. The following rules of mental control over the omnipresent phenomenology of the modern environment. I really need the file before Mr. Rogers comes by again. Silence! Did you say I'm reading? Sorry I disturbed you. Oh, Laura, how was your beverage, by the way? Beverage? In the hall, the can of soda. Tropical punch, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Not bad, actually. Reminded me of... a pina colada. Did it now. Delicious, I bet. I'll just get back to my book. A very important book. Very, very important. Distractions which divert 98% of our brain capacity from the more highly evolved regions of the cerebral cortex. Everybody go into the ground floor? Yeah. yeah. The source of the power is located in the pineal gland, or vestigial third eye. You, sir? Where the power of the all-encompassing life force. Sir, you going to the first floor, too? He's talking to you, buddy. What's the matter, you deaf? What? Of course I'm going to the first floor. Where else would I be going? Watch your fingers. Going down. The more complete the mental picture, the more complete the result. Focus your mind and concentrate to the exclusion of all... From the lower to the higher chakras, until you feel the power surging. You getting on the train or what? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. Then move along. All aboard! Please step back. The doors are closing. Mental imaging of the desired result to the exclusion of all else. <laughs> Now, where was I? Chapter 9. The energy generated by pure mind has an electrical coefficient of... Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. The numbers are absolutely correct. Unequivocally. That being the case, it stands to reason that the conclusions are correct as well. Why, the mind must be the most underrated power in the entire universe. Given the proper concentration, well, there's really no limit to what a man could do. No limit at all. Look at them down there. People. So many. I wonder, if I concentrated hard enough, could I actually get rid of... But why not? Why not? Concentration, that's all it takes. I have the power here, inside my head. Sheer concentration. Concentrate on, on getting rid of all those people. I wonder if I could do it in one fell swoop. Or, or knock them off one by one. Just think of it. Nobody in the elevator, in the office, the cafeteria, or on the street. None! Not in the hall, or on the stairs! Nobody except... Mr. Beechcraft! Mr. Beechcraft! Who is it? You know perfectly well who it is. It's Mrs. Weller. The rent is due, Mr. Beechcraft. Do you hear me? The rent. I'm not going away till you pay, Mr. Beechcraft. Mr. Beechcraft! Close your eyes and repeat the following words three times. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. The rent, Mr. Beechcraft. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. The rent. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. Mr. Beechcraft. Mrs. Weller? 
Mrs. Weller? Mrs. Weller? Aha! You're gone! Concentration, that's the key. And I have it. <laughs> Today the landlady, tomorrow the world! Beechcraft. Is it? I only meant... I know perfectly well what you meant. Why don't you just keep to yourself and mind your own beeswax? Well, I don't know why I bother, Beechcraft. I was only trying to be a good neighbor. I've tried to be a good neighbor for years. And what good does it do me? Why don't Go you keep away. To yourself from now Disappear. I'll stay in my be apartment extinct. And you stay in Go yours. away. Never the twain Disappear. Meet, okay? Be that extinct. You because it suits... Aha! I wasn't dreaming. It works. 113, 114, 115, 116. Out of the way, son. Make me. 117. Very well. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Go away, disappear, be extinct. Hey, give me back my ball. I don't have your ball, young man. Then where did it go? Ma! Silence! Ma, the I'm afraid you leave me ball. no choice. Go away, disappear. Ma! Be he won't give it extinct. back. He won't. And another one bites the dust. Hey, watch it. Out of the way, jerk. I was here first. Let me through, please. I need to catch the 732. Officer, that man cut in front of me. Hey, you! I said you! Surely you're not addressing me. Put a token in like everybody else. I don't have a token. So get one. I don't have time to buy tokens. If I miss my train... Step out of the line. What for? I'm writing you up. You're going to get a big fat fine for cheating the city out of- But it's only a token. I'll mail it to you. I'll deposit two tokens tomorrow morning, but I simply do not have the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I heard it all before. This one may take some doing. What'd you say? Nothing, officer. Concentrate. Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. Say, are you cursing me out? Go away. Disappear. Be extinct. All right, that's it. I'm taking you in for insulting the transit officer. I got a nice pair of bracelets that'll fit you just fine. Go away, disappear, be extinct. You were saying, officer? You were saying? <laughs> All right, 732, let's get ready to rumble. Beechcraft is coming through. What? No line for the elevator this morning? No pushing? No shoving? My, my, that is unusual. Anyone else? No? All right, then. Going up? Morning, everyone. Laura? Ah, oh, you're not here, are you? Slept in, I presume? Like a great many people. Fine with me. I'll just sit down here and get to work without being rushed. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Jones Stephen. A rather large export to the UK. I'll just see if everything's in order. At my own pace for once. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Better finish this one before Mr. Rogers gets here. If he ever shows up. <laughs> now, let me see. Oh, well and good. Well and good. A major improvement. Only, when I finish this and the other files, what else is there to do? With no one breathing down my neck, how should one occupy his time? Hmm. Isn't it time for lunch yet? I think I'll just have the salad today. Some soup to start off and crackers. No hurry, mind you. Plenty of time to digest my meal. Where to sit? Why, any table at all? The morning paper. What's new in the world today? White House? Mm. Middle East? Mm -hmm. Federal Reserve Bank? Oh, it's no use. I hate eating alone. And worse than that, I'm bored. If only I had someone to talk to. One person, that's all. Someone quiet, well-mannered, intelligent. Someone like me, in other words. That's it. Concentrate, Beechcraft, concentrate. You called? It worked. Of course it worked. Don't you have any confidence in yourself? 
pleased to meet you. The name's Beechcraft. I know. And your name is? Archibald. Call me Archie. You too. I mean, call me Archie as well, if you like. I like it just fine. How's tricks, Arch, old man? Bit on the slow side this morning. Look here, Arch. This isn't working. Wouldn't you agree? Why not? Let's be frank. Too much of a good thing. Well, I wouldn't say so. But you're thinking it. Let's just say I'm temporarily accessible to suggestions about how to occupy my time. Face it, you're bored to tears. Solitude is one thing, but loneliness... Loneliness is quite another. Loneliness. I despise people. Loathe them. And I, Archibald Beechcraft, have done away with them. For good and all, mind you. For good and all. I'm leaving. You haven't finished your lunch. I don't have much of an appetite. Thought about any alternatives? Alternatives to what? To this. It's like an empty movie set in here. I don't even want to think about what it's like outside. Look at yourself. You don't have idea one about how to fill the day. People are bad enough, but inactivity is even worse. You're talking nonsense. I'm content. I'm honestly and truly content. For the first time in my life, I have managed to rid myself of the worst scourge there is. The general populace. So what are you going to do? Splurge and buy a can of tropical fruit punch from the soft drink machine? Will that do it for you? If the truth be known, I would like... Well, I would appreciate a little diversion of some kind. Any kind. You mean like a change in the weather? That's it. Perhaps a little unseasonal rain. Or a lot of rain. Let's make it a tropical storm with thunder and lightning. The works. That should shake things up. All I have to do is concentrate. Hmm. Not that exciting, is it? Maybe we need to add something spectacular. Like an earthquake. I'm sure you want to do that. Why not? Here goes. You mean there it goes? I can imagine what the office looks like right now. My desk! All your files on the floor. I'm gonna take some sorting. Enough! No earthquake and no storm either. Forget it! So now what, Arch, old man? I've had it for the day. I'm gonna take the rest of the afternoon off. Uh-huh. And do what? Stroll down the street? Take a ride on the subway all by your lonesome? Boy, I'll bet the old apartment building's quiet as a tomb. It's starting to get to you, isn't it? The thing of it is, I don't care much for people, but it's difficult not having anyone. Present company excluded. I guess it's a trade-off. That's the crux of the problem. Frankly, there isn't a breed of human being that I can stomach. Ever think of a cocker spaniel? I never cared much for animals, either. Most of all, though, I can't stand people. Thanks. Well, except for you, naturally. But that's because you're a higher class of individual. I... Wait a minute. That's it! That's what? Why didn't I think of it before? People I can stand. That's what I'll do. I'll create people who are just like me. A world full of Archie Beechcrafts. Now that's a thought. You bet your sweet life it is. I'll will it. I'll concentrate, and from now on, everyone will be exactly like me. It's so simple. And when will this new era be ushered in? Tomorrow morning. I'll re-people the Earth. Nothing but my kind of folks. In fact, why wait? How about right now? 15th floor, everybody off. Look at them, like sardines. Rude, thoughtless people. Worthless, every last one. Nobody has any manners now. Late. Thanks to them. Listen to them. They sound just like me. If you're not kidding, take a gander at their faces. They look like us, too. A rather handsome lot, you must admit. Where are they headed? Back to work, I presume, those who chose not to dine in the cafeteria. A sight for sore eyes, eh, Archie? It certainly is. Now that I've decided to replenish the population in a kinder, gentler mold. This, I gotta see. United Tool and Die, one moment, please. You son of a noise, the miserable noise. I'll go out of my ever-loving mind. Keep it down, I'm trying to work. Can't hear myself think.